I'm really honored that you guys both are here and um to start maybe you guys could just introduce yourselves and just say where you're from okay. and uh yeah just let's start with that well i'm travis Irvin. i'm from uh east tennessee knoxville okay. uh, god's country as we like to say uh i ran off and joined the marine corps at 18 and that's kind of where my this story kind of starts okay yeah okay and how about you yeah uh, i'm Mohammed Idris Hamdar. Uh, originally, I'm from Afghanistan. I was born in Kabul, and like I joined with the Marines uh, between 2010 and 11, and that's what my story just start from there. And 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 where did you guys where where did you guys meet? When did you guys meet? We met in Marja, Afghanistan, in 2010. So my platoon was pushed out to Marja to uh, continue clearing operations there. Marja at that time and down in Helmand province was like the last big uh, Taliban stronghold. And, uh, you know, we don't have interpreters. We've got, you know, Marines that'll kind of get punched out to go to language schools, but it's, you know, it's, it's such a complex uh, language that they're speaking, Dari and Pashto. It's, there's not a lot known about it. So, you know, our guys can kind of speak words here and there, but we need, you know, better linguists with us. And so uh, the U.S. government will reach out uh, to Afghan locals that are uh, thoroughly, thoroughly vetted to come work with us. And that's where uh, I ran into him. And because so much of w w what you're doing over there is, uh, you, you know, in, in engaging and trying to gather information, find out who's who and where they're at, right? Like, can you just explain the need for interpreters and why that is and that it didn't yeah. start off like that? Yeah. And can you just sort of talk about like your kind of history with it from what you saw? Um, well, you know, the language part is huge because we're out running around with guns and, uh, you know, looking for bombs. But, you know, there's there's more information we need. We need to talk to locals and figure out, you know, what are you seeing in the morning times? What are you seeing in afternoon and evening times? And, you know, who's who around this village? And that's where guys like Rom come in and, you know, they can chat these guys up and gain trust and rapport with them. And, yeah, it's a, they're a key piece of our operations. Do you remember when you guys first met? Was there anything? What, do you remember your first impressions of each other? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> the first time when I just met uh, my dear brother, you know, I just call him my dear brother. He is more than, than my blood brother, you know. Uh, it was in Marja, a district of uh, uh, Helmand right. province of Afghanistan. Uh, it was like uh, in the midnight, I just like uh, uh, came from another post to their post. Uh, we just walked like 30 or 45 minutes. Uh, then we arrived to the post where was my mission started from that day. Uh, so in the early morning, I just met Travis and also uh, my other team Marines over there. It was the first day I met him over there. And my mission just started with them from there. And and so at, when, when you guys, was that your first, was that the first time you had worked with the Marines or had you already been working with the Marines? It Corps? was the first time. The first time. time. And yeah. what can you just, I, I mean, the best way you can, I mean, can you kind of like walk me through where that decision comes from? Like what made you want to get to work with them and, and, and you, you know, what was going on in your life in those days? Yeah, actually, before I joined Marine, uh, since uh, I just realized it and I have experience about my country story, you know, I just planned and decided with myself to be go outside this country and just live in a peaceful area, you know, not in darkness. So just one year ago, when I just joined with Marines, I just start like, uh, I have just met one of the like a captain, he she was a, my friend as well. She was like uh, working with the U.S. Army uh, in Logar province, and I was on that time working for an uh, NGO, I mean land government organization on that time. Uh, so I met her over there, and it was one of my target to start moving and put the first steps to go to the United States for higher education and for like a peaceful life not only for myself for my uh, children future so it was my uh, vision and target how many kids do you have uh i have three three kids yes H I how old are they 
Uh, my oldest, just uh, she's eight. And I have a twins, uh -huh. boy and girl. Yeah, they're four and a half. That's beautiful. Crazy yeah. kids. Yeah, crazy yeah. kids. Crazy yeah. kids. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. And 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 like for either one of you guys, like, can you just? Uh, I mean, I know it's a big question, but you know, I, th I think for all of us that 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 haven't served and haven't been over there and are just sort of like all our news is 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 filtered in from from various different parties. Can you guys just sort of explain? At that time, you're talking about like 2008, 2009, correct? Like, what what what's the state of Afghanistan? Like, when when was the first time you were over there? What what what, do you, what what did you see in Afghanistan? What are the biggest misconceptions? I'd love to hear about growing up there. I'd just like to hear more about it. Uh, common miscon. I remember the first time that I got there. You know, that was 2010. I'm young. You know, I'm like 20 years old. Can't even like you know can't even legally drink. You know, but I'm over running around with a gun and. You know, and you're you're so immature, you know, at that at that age. I remember before we even got sent to Afghanistan. I knew we were going to Afghanistan. And I knew we were going to end up going to a place called Marja, and but I'm so young. I didn't even like look into what Marja even was. Right. You know. Right. Like how easy that would have been for me to get on the old Google yeah. and look up what this place is and what it looks like. But we didn't even. It's like send us wherever. We don't care. Wherever the fuck you want to send us. Yeah. Totally. You know. And we show up over there and, you know, Marja, it's, it's down south. It's like the, you know, agri agricultural hub in the country. And, uh, I mean, it's just farmland and, and poor people. That's it. You know, you're expecting to see, you know, I guess it was, it, it was hard for, you know, somebody at my age over there. What are we doing over here fighting in this farmland? We're surrounded by all these poor people over right. here. Right. Why are there Marines dying, you know, and Army guys dying every day? Like, what are we fighting over right now, you know? And then, you know, as the deployment goes on, you know, you start to build relationships in these little cities and villages and you see these little kids running around and, you know, they have nothing, you know, just absolutely nothing. So uh, that was a wild thing for us to see at that age, you know. And when, and when, and when you engage with the Taliban, like when you, when you, when you engage with, you know, the enemy while, while, while you're there, is it, I mean, because you hear about it all the time. Was it easy for you to sort of like decipher who was who, or were you were, were, were you able to get like garner some sort of understanding of yeah. what the people of Marja felt about the Taliban and what that relationship was? Uh, you know, I think from the the people of Marja, you know, from their mindset, from what I've gathered and witnessed, you know, they're just trying to survive. You know, they know that Americans aren't going to be there forever. We know we're not going to be there forever. The Taliban knows we're not going to be there forever. So, you know, the Taliban really, they really pick and choose on when they're going to show their face and when they're going to do an attack. And yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just a wild, it's a wild place, you know, and it's not like, you know, the Taliban's running around in uniforms that say Taliban. Right. You know, they're blending in with these villagers and you don't know who's who, you know, it's the one day they're, you know, you think this guy's your friend and then later on, you know, you find out that they're giving up information to the town right, so and they're, they're spotting us, you know, they're, they're watching us come out of our little patrol bases, which I think a lot of people, you know, they, they think military bases and it's these giant bases with jets launching off of them. <laughs> That's not where we were at. I mean, we were in somebody's house that we took over in the middle of the night and filled sandbags up and made posts in the middle of the night. You know, that's how we're living. You know, we show up into a farmer's compound, throw them some money and say, you got to get out of here. And, and, there's really no uh, separation from where we're living in the city. I mean, we are in the city. There's no, you hear that term, oh, you leave the wire, you know, like there's no wire, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as we would come out of our patrol bases, you know, we'd usually run three operations a day, morning, afternoon, and night. And uh, we'd have these little uh, devices that could pick up on their radio traffic. And uh, guys like Rom would be listening to these devices and relaying to us, okay, this is what they're saying. This is where they're at. Oh, they're planning an attack here. But you can hear them counting us and calling out where our weapon systems are. Oh, here's a long rifle over here. Here's a machine gunner over here. You know, and it's crazy to hear that. You're like, holy fuck. Like, they're watching us. You know, mm -hmm. you can't see them, and you don't know who's giving up that information. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of times it's villagers that they'll pay off, you know. But so it sounds like an environment where, like, trust is so sort of impossible to kind of like, – how people sort of feel about you mm -hmm. seems seems enormously difficult. And, you know, you guys refer to each other as brothers. I mean, how does – 
I'm really interested in, in how trust is earned. And then what's that environment like? Is it the same for you? Is it the same for folks who, who grew up in Marja for, 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 for the, the farmers or the villagers that work there? I mean, it, it, can you just talk about trust in that environment and how it works? Yeah, uh, actually, it was so difficult to make it, make them trust us, you know, so difficult for those kind of pupils because the pupils over there they don't have knowledge they were not Ill, like uh, literate pupil the schools was closed over there and their entire life n not only for women for for the male generation as well you know so all of them just grew up with the shovel with the farming nothing else like that i mean the villagers and on that area but it was just ANA, I mean Afghan National Army, and the, beside of them, it was the Marines, you know. We just make trust for them. We just had like make sure, you know, I mean like big meetings every week over there. Like we all just the key called, leaders would come from the village to yeah. sit and talk with us, and we'd develop rapport with them like that. Yeah, we just like motivate them for democracy. We just motivate them for having peaceful life and there. We want to make them happy every day than previous at the past. So it was their life and it was that that uh, they trust us. Not 100% but a little more than before. And every day we just getting their trust as much as we can. And meanwhile, you're you're trying to earn the trust of, of uh, did, did you feel like you had the trust of the Marines that you were with right off the bat? Of course. You did feel that. Yes. You did feel exactly. that. Exactly. And, 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 and just tell, tell me a little bit more like kind of just what, whether it's philosophically or like, I, I understand, I, I guess what you were saying is that you had this urge, you knew you were dedicated, you're, you're, you're an educated man, you're a dedicated man to your family, you knew that eventually you wanted to what, you wanted to leave Afghanistan, right? When did that feeling start? You know, was that, was that before the war? Like, you, what, did something change in your life to, to, to make you feel that way? Did, did you always know that you wanted to get out of Afghanistan? Yeah, exactly. Since I was just uh, like uh, seeing my father's life. What was your father's life like? Uh, I mean, just he grew it as a human over there, you know. He didn't like had higher education, you know. He didn't have like own independence for himself, for his family, you know, for my grandfather, for my uncles, for my aunts, for all of his family. So when I was just looking at them every time, it was just like making me sad. So I just decided on that time with myself to find a way to go out from here and make a good life. Change this. Did your this father life. want that for you? Did your father want you to have a different yeah, life? Yeah, exactly. But, but my grandfather, I mean, they didn't want this for my father, you know? So that's why, because my father was, uh, my father was like educated person. He was working with defense ministry on, from since he just born and joined it with the ar army, with the military. So he didn't like, uh, has any stop for me to don't go there or here. Just he wants me to grow up in a very peaceful area like this. So on that time, I just decided to start working with the uh, like uh, private uh, companies because it was that time the private companies was the way to go to America or go to the Western ca countries for better life. You know, that's why I just uh, stepped on on this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can, can you sort of remember your your uh, just sort of like your own personal history with with, with, with the Taliban and, and, and how you sort of felt that 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 the what it's sort of the relationship with kind of like the common the common person in your country with the Taliban and what are the pressures to join and 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 how do most folks feel about them there and do, and, and and as they came into power did something change drastically in the country and if so do you remember is there any memories of that uh yeah actually in the first time when they just got our country i mean it was like 1990 or 1992 I think so this years when they just got and handed over our country I was a kid but still I remember some memories from that time you know that they were just stoning the people stoning the women's you know stoning stoning yeah and also they just killed you know they just killed the pupils like 
in front of the eyes of the pupils you know they just gathered the pupils they just announced it in the radio there was no other television on that time they just announced in the radio that we have like hanging you know how old were you when that happened ah uh, i was like maybe 14 i can say or maybe 13 but still i remember that you know it was big stadium in kabul just close by the presidential palace close by so it was like crazy time on on that time you know and you ask it what what why they just killed this people you know for nothing they just killed innocent people and, and i mean i hear i mean so it was i'm so please sorry. please so it was all that that changed my mind to just evacuate from this country as soon as you can even just recently, I mean, in the recent years, I had special life over there. I had my own business, my own company, everything, but I left behind everything. Because I didn't see any bright future for my children, for my family. This, this brutality and, uh, like you say, this sort of like meaningless brutality. Do you remember the first time you either witnessed that or, or you, is something that kind of defined them to you or or, or, or or the first thing that you heard or that you saw over there that 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 showed you kind of that 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 to define the ethos of those people um you know i think the my first like experience like holy shit, we're at war now you know is when you see a guy that you know that you drank beer with and hang out with blown up you know and his body's ripped in half you know, and this is a good guy, you know, or an, another guy that's been shot, you know, and killed, you know, you see in your buddies dead, you know, running them to helicopters, you know, that's, that's like the, this is real moment, you know, and the, just the brutality that, you know, these, the, the Taliban would do, you know, they would go out to these farmland that we're in and, and just plant IEDs everywhere, all over the fields. And, you know, kids would step on them all the time, you know, innocent people would just walk along, you know, and step and step on these devices Taliban doesn't care yeah they're after us at the end of the day but they're putting them in the, these, this family's backyard you know eventually one of these kids is going to step on this or some guy on a tractor plowing his field is going to you know hit this IED and that's when it's like for real you know it's like seeing little kids suffering you know I did a little stint after my my time with the uh, Marine Corps I got a job with National Geographic and I, I went back to Afghanistan and kind of got to see the war from a, from a non, you know, infantryman grunt view, you know, because in the, in the grunts, it's the, this is what you see. You know, you're, you're, you got your mission. This, you don't understand where these helicopters are coming from or where you're sending your wounded off to. You don't, you don't see it at all. Uh, but with the, that job, you know, I got to take a step back and kind of be a spectator in war and kind of see, okay, here's where the fighter pilots are taking off from. Here's the uh, logistics side of the house. Here's the helicopters. And then I did a little time in a frontline hospital. Uh, it was called a shock trauma platoon. And I, we just sat in this tent for you know a month, two months, periodically in and out for a month, two months. And man, the casualties just keep coming in, you know? And it's just like, holy shit. I remember I had never like cried, you know, uh, the unit that we were with, we lost 15 guys. Mm. You know, 15 guys killed, which is fucking crazy. And so I remember the Purple Heart ceremony after we came back. I mean, there was a hundred people lined up in a formation. There were so many Purple Hearts handed out that they didn't do it like individually. You know, like, okay, this person got shot, this and that. Okay, next guy, we're going to read off. There were so many people that they just did it all at once. Wow. You know, but anyway, so to, to be in this, uh, and I'd never shed a tear over it. It really hadn't, you know, lost some really close friends. And when I, you know, a year later, I went back with that Nat Geo job, and I'm sitting in this uh, this tent, and the, you know, in come the casualties, and here my dumbass is with a camera, running around filming it, because I want people to understand what's going on over there, you know. But you really feel like a piece of shit running around filming this dude with a gunshot wound in his forehead, you know. You're just it's just unreal. But I remember this: there was a Marine that came in, and he was on an early morning patrol. And uh, he was the radio man, and he had a radio antenna sticking out of his uh, backpack. 
and there's a lot of ungrounded wires over there and this guy's patrolling around and, and his radio wire hit one of these ungrounded wires and it electrocuted him mm. and uh you know they his his unit they call in the medevac birds uh they're called dust off great guys these black hawks come in snatch this guy up bring him back to the little tent that i'm at you know filming these casualties and interviewing surgeons and stuff like that and uh in comes this guy and he's back in the day we would put the radio mic like in between our kevlar you know we got our helmet and you got the strap well the radio guys would run these run the hand mic up in here anyway they bring this guy in and this hand mic is melted into his uh. face and i remember watching this dude like nobody knows what's going on over here you know i remember when we were there no one no one really asked questions you know it's like oh you were in afghanistan you know everybody's so desensitized because we've been over there for 20 years you know they were like oh yeah it's just war you know this isn't normal being somewhere for 20 years you know but yeah that was that that incident when i i saw that dude and all my buddies that I was with the Marine Corps, they'll, they'll make fun of me for telling this story and saying that I cried. But it's it's the truth. I mean, I, I filmed this dude. They tried to resuscitate this guy for 15, 20 minutes. And then finally, everybody in the room agreed they're, they're calling it. And I remember, I, you know, turned the record button off, went outside and cried like a bitch. Mm. Yeah, cried like a bitch. And this old, crusty surgeon came out. He used to be an 8404 corpsman that used to run with the grunts. But now he's kind of leveled up and he's doing bigger and better things. But he came out and he, little tiny guy, came out and put his arm around me and just, I'd never met that dude in my life, but he knew, you know. Where you were at. Yeah. 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 Because when you see, you know, journalists, I was technically a journalist over there at that time. They're like, oh, who's this journalist? Okay, they have no yeah. idea what's going on. But, and some people ask about my background and, and stuff like that. But, you know, not a lot of people knew that I was a part of that as well the year prior. You know, my unit had lost 15 dudes in that same AO that they're in. But yeah, that was like a, just a unreal, like, I'll, I'll never forget that. So it's like you, you, you both, I, and, I, and I, I hate to, I hate to stay on it too much, but, but, but I mean, you both are sort of describing this kind of chaotic, wild environment that yeah. just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And this is like, yeah. this is your home. You grew up in it. I mean, for, for, for you, do you remember that when you first sort of had that thought, like, what the hell is going on here? And, yeah. and I'm just really interested in like, why maybe your reasons for wanting to sign up, like your reason for, for, yeah. for, for wanting to, to enlist and, and, and then, you know, um, just kind of your journey through, 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 through then being there and, 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 and what you saw and what your feelings are and, and, and your sort of understanding that either grew or your lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my story with wanting to go over there kind of, or, or wanting to go the military route started young with me. I, I was a part of this program called the Breakaway Program, uh, where they'd send like court ordered kids out to the woods to, you know, get their asses kicked. In you the got in trouble? No, I didn't. I was like a student staff and my, fa my parents ran with the staff that did got it. it. All outdoorsy mountain men type people. Got really, it. really shaped who I am and, yep. and my values. And I really saw the benefit of, uh, going out to a shitty place and living with nothing and having, you know, only having the guys around you. I really saw the benefit of that at a young age and pushing yourself to that at a young age. And, uh, and also, you know, September 11th, you know, I, I, I was never allowed to miss school ever. Like my parents are like, you're going to school. We don't care if you've got COVID, right? <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, going. Yeah. Uh, I come from a big family. There's five kids in my family all together. Yeah. Uh, but on September 11th, my older, uh, sibling or no one of my younger brothers had to go to the doctor so eeny meeny miny mo i'm staying home to watch the youngest so i'm sitting at home on the couch How watching. Old were you? Uh, i was in seventh grade so i think wow. 12 13 years old and i'm sitting on the couch and then uh watching uh sports center you know big baseball guy sure catching up on i'm like this is nice i'm hanging out yeah no yeah. school today yeah, holiday yeah, yeah. And uh, the phone rings and it's my dad. And he's like, turn on the TV right now. And I flipped, uh, you know, flip on the news. And, uh, you know, like five, six, seven minutes later, we see the, uh, the second plane, second plane yeah. hit the tower. Um, and that was a pivotal moment for me at such a young age. It was like, how dare these motherfuckers? You know, and I had a connection with, you know, I grew up in Tennessee. But, you know, during the summers, I'd go, you know, up to New Jersey. My grandparents had a beach house there and uh, like on the ocean. Uh, on Long Beach Island. And a lot of these people running around there were, you know, uh, 
firefighters from New York City and NYPD. Sure. And, and sure. So it was like, how, how dare these people do this? But, you know, and it sounds corny and this and that, but I knew at that, at that age, like, this is what I'm doing. And I remember being so fucking pissed that I was not young enough to, to, to sign up right then. Like, I remember being livid yep. and like counting down the clock, like when I turn 18 years old or when I can sign this contract, I'm going. Yeah, and I remember being afraid I was going to miss the war. A lot of guys, you know, say that too. You know, it's like, I need to get in the pipeline right away with a rifle in my hand to go see these dudes on the front lines as soon as possible. Do you remember, do you remember where you were? Do you remember where you were with uh, 9-11 or do you remember your first sort of like understanding of it or, or, or did, did it affect your life? Yeah, on that time I was like very young boy, you know, and also we didn't have any access on internet, on television, no television, nothing else. We, we even didn't have like electricity, you know, so but uh, the older people I mean, my dad, uncle, and other pupils, they were just hearing the news from BBC, you know, and the radio. And they were talking on that time that, like, an uh, incident happened to the Trade Center in the New York, in America, that the tourist groups hit that by the Al-Qaeda like this on that time. I was hearing all of this, but I was so kid, I didn't care about it so much, and I didn't have knowledge about that. So yeah, I remember the just short things like that. But you, but 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 in in Afghanistan at the time, you know, w was there a general feeling? I mean, when you're when you know at these big soccer stadiums, there are these huge executions, and there's this group that has taken over, and they're 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 ruling with brutality, and now you know that, you know, somebody somebody came and, and, and poked the bear of America. And now, now, now America is getting involved in some way. Was there a feeling in Af Afghanistan that this could potentially come to us or touch us? Like, would people have any idea of that or, or, or no? Yeah, definitely. Like I said, pupils were just talking about that and had like feeling, you know, for the pupils, you know, why this like happened, what's wrong with that, you know, but since most of the pupils like you don't you know uh they were not like uh, have the outside or i can say for you like a knowledge of exterior countries uh, to know what's happening over there you know or what's going on over there that's why they were not like uh, have like deep feeling what's happening or they didn't see anything by television you know by the tv to see what happened with this pupil, you know? But of course, yeah, they had like feeling and talking about that on that time. Yeah. You know, I think seeing over there, these, these, these people on the day to day, they don't have time for like conversational, like gossip of what's going on. They're right. trying to like feed their kids yeah. in a country yeah. where there's no jobs and trying to scrape, beg, borrow, steal to get their kids fed. You know, like they don't have time to like, sit around and right. you know scroll the internet and what's right. going Philosophize. on Philosophize. Yeah, yeah like they're like well, dude i gotta feed my kids yep. you know and they're just scraping and by all means necessary by right? any means yeah. necessary yeah. they'll yeah. do it and you know i don't fault them from that that's right because what would i do to feed my family and his kids and my loved ones and, and people around my circle i would do anything you know to do it when you first get there were you, were you able to make any sense of anything or like you said it's just this grunt mentality just like yeah. follow orders one uh, one foot in front of the other i remember we flew in we were at a big base called leatherneck and they're like you know we we get our briefs from the medevac units that are going to be supporting us hey guys this is how you load your casualties in uh this is what we're seeing in the area these are the tactics that they're using watch out for ieds here watch out from there there you know they're just they put them in everything from roadkill to the curb to trees to above you, you know, they're just, so we're getting schooled up on that. And then they load us on helicopters and we're like, all right, we're gonna go get some right now. And we're gonna go replace a unit that's there. There was a unit called uh, 3rd Battalion 6 Marines that was there. They did the initial push in there and gain the foothold. And then here we come in to replace him. And then they, they punch out and go home. Uh, but we landed on this, uh, it was a bigger base in Marja, it was called, uh, like uh hansen i think yeah, right hansen. yeah uh cop hansen it was called and then uh we land and then you know it's so loud and chaotic and dust is flying everywhere and we we run off the bird and then the bird takes off and then it's like quiet you don't hear anything 
And I remember you could hear gunfights going on outside, you know, because that base we're on was like the big battalion level. That's where our battalion commanders are at. There's like nice little chow halls. They're living it up, you know, in cots and, you know, they got nice stuff. And then we hear these gunfights going on where we're going because we're going to go take over one of these houses. Uh, and, and I remember there was a... a and, and it's villages? Like the gunfights are coming from... Yeah. Because from, it's not mountainous, right? No, I mean, no. It's, it's, it's straight farmland, swampy cotton fields, weed, opium, uh, corn, watermelon, you know, agricultural uh, stuff. Uh, difficult to operate in. Um, but yeah, I remember we were hearing all this going on. They're like, well, what's going on out there? Because that's my first... You know, I'd been to Iraq before. I went to Ramadi, uh, Iraq back in uh, 2008. And we spent seven months there just waiting for something to happen and never did. You know, as a grunt, if you're not getting after it, you're like, dude, this sucks. Yeah. And, you know, and your chain of command's fucking with you, yeah. you know, trying to keep you busy and keep you mad, you know. And, <laughs> and I remember wishing for that. Oh, God, I just want this gunfight. We'll fast forward to Afghanistan in 2010. We land on that base. And then what's this gunfight going on? And it's like, oh, you guys are going there. The unit you're replacing, the platoon you're replacing, that's them that's right them. now. That's them, yeah. And if I remember correctly, that was the day that a, a Hilo was shot down. I want to say it was like a uh, a Cobra, I want to say. But don't, don't quote me on it. But there was a Hilo that was shot down out there in our battle space. And at 2010 in the time, you don't hear of helicopter, U.S. American helicopters being shot down. So we're like, what the fuck is this place we're going to? So they load us up and we get a little brief. And then they load us up in a, like a seven ton, it's called. It's a big transport truck for you know people and they they drive us out there and we get off and uh we get to this patrol base right as that uh squad is coming back in from that gunfight and i remember looking at these dudes and yeah. they they look like something straight out of vietnam here we are fresh camis all of our gears good you know we got the civilian weight we're carrying from the states you know we're not patrol ready you know uh but yeah i remember them coming back in and, and they look like they were just you know in a gunfight, and they were, you know, sweaty, we're rocking bandanas, not blousing their boots, cuffing their sleeves. We don't care about military regulation and haircuts, dudes with mohawks. And you're like, dude, this is awesome. Like, this is where I want to be right now. We finally, like, reached this place. Yeah. And so they took the, uh, for the next, like, two or three days, they took the key leaders uh, from our platoon that's replacing this platoon. So they took, like, the platoon sergeants, uh, lieutenant, squad leaders and team leaders and i was a team leader at the time and they they took us out on patrol with those guys kind of like a left seat right seat with them and there's no vehicles uh we're all everything's on foot wow um and so we start they start integrating us into their patrols on how what's going on and they're giving tips and you know don't cross here cross here little things to look for and we're just trying to like soak it, soak all, it all in, in trying yeah. to soak because we know is it is it possible to soak it all in it, i mean you feel like like how much are you retaining on, on that first. You know, I think you're in a, a survival situation. So your brain is on like max overload to yeah. try and retain everything. Yeah. But I remember just being like a, we call it a fucking gear bomb. You know, there's like a way to patrol in Marsha and there's, you know, there, there's what the states, you know, patrol around in North Carolina teaches you. I got to yeah. have all this gear. I got to have all this. I need this. I need water, you know, but when you're patrolling on foot miles and miles, it comes down to weight. You're stripping all sorts of weight, uh, learning how to wear your night vision correctly, learning how to, you know, use your thermal scopes and, and PEC 15s with your lasers on them. And there's, there's a, there's a massive learning curve that you're sure that you're, you're battling. Sure. And you don't want to look like a piece of shit either. You know, it's like you got junior guys looking at you. You right. can't seem like you're iffy about something. It's probably pretty impossible to not be iffy, especially in the beginning. Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. like you're, you're, yeah, you're making absolutely. it up as you go. I mean, you're drinking out of a fire hose, right? You know, right. Dudes are getting shot. You're hearing about all their dudes that were killed and shot and maimed from IEDs. And, uh, you know, your biggest fear is just letting somebody down behind you, yeah. you know, not yeah. seeing an IED, the dude behind you steps on it or. And so it's really that night. I mean, it's like first night in, it's like, you're like, okay, this is, this is going to be different. This is, this yeah. is, this is wild. This makes no. And do you remember your first sort of exposure to the villagers and like, is there any, is there any kind of feeling or to, to just the nationals in general, is there any yeah. feeling like, what do they think of me? Or yeah. like, could, could, cause I, I guess what you guys both describe is there's, and, and so many of the folks that, that I've had the honor to talk to have just talked about this one, you're, 
every step you take, there could be an ID. Mm -hmm. Plus, any person you see yeah. could be friend or foe. And there's really no way. It's very, very hard to figure that out. Yeah. So I imagine that's just an environment yeah. of just complete and utter chaos. Yeah. And again, such a where we're eventually going to get to such a difficult environment to achieve you know, real trust and real camaraderie with, mm -hmm. with, 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 with people that were born in different places. Yeah. You know, I'd never had any exposure to really the outside of the U.S. before. I'd, I don't think I'd ever talked to somebody from another country other than a, a woman that my mom uh, would go get her nails done at the old Vietnamese shop. And my mom helped this lady study for, you know, her uh, citizenship test. And I think that was my only. Wow. I, if I remember correctly, that was like the only exposure I'd, I'd had trying to communicate with somebody who didn't speak English right out of the gate. Wow. Uh, but yeah, so we, we roll in there. And I think my first exposure to an Afghan is the uh, Afghan army that we're kind of paired up with. They got they sent a couple Afghan army squads to patrol around with our squads because we're trying to teach them what's going on here. And this is how you, you know, take care of your country. This is how you gain security in your country. Do what we do. So communicating with them and teaching them our tactics and which was man was difficult. And it was a hell of a thing to ask, looking back at it, for a bunch of 19, 20, 21 year old kids to do. You know, that's kind of a Green Beret Special Forces thing. You know, those Green Berets get in and they uh, create networks and they know how to talk to people and befriend people. And, then, you know, that's the whole Green Beret mission, right. you know, other than going out smoke checking dudes. Right. Their right. mission is to go in there and make friends somewhere. Right. Well, asking a grunt unit to go do that, yeah, it's like I mean, it's with like no training whatsoever. Which, plus, you're not, I mean, like making friends is not. Right. Th this, yeah, the that's idea, like yeah. the time for talking's over. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we would like teach these guys, okay, this is how you wear your gear. This is how you make a little brief, a little pre-mission brief. When we go on patrol, you're going to go left. We're going to go right. Uh, we're gonna, When we hit this, you know, building up here, we're, we'll button hook right and we'll link up with you guys. Over, You know, there's a lot of complex stuff. And you're worried about, you always should know where your people are out on patrol because everybody's running around with guns. I don't want to end up shooting my guys over sure. here, getting spooked because everybody's trigger happy. Sure. You know, right. everybody's ready to pull the trigger, you know, because, you know, in, in war, there's a clear hold and build phase. Can you, t can you explain that? Uh, I mean, I think, don't quote me on this, but I, I don't remember what, you know, army or, or military genius figured this out. There's a clear hold and build phase. Well, a clear phase is, the enemy's still here and operating freely. We need to clear this whole place out. And then we're going to hold it, make sure everything's good to go, and then we're going to start to rebuild. Right. We're going to start to rebuild schools, hospitals, roads, all of this. Well, we're still in the clear phase. Right, right. You know, so. But, yeah, I remember, you know, linking up with these Afghan army guys, and we'd create these little terrain models as best as we could. Like, okay, you guys are going to go this way, we're going to go this way. And I remember... I don't know, it was probably our 10th patrol with them. We, we punched out, and we've got nicknames for all these Afghan Army guys. I remember this Afghan Army guy we called Love Seat, like you would sit on, you know, for whatever reason, we called him Love Seat. And he had an M249 saw, which is like a squad automatic yeah. weapon. And we punch out, and man, we're not 10 minutes outside of the gate. <laughs> and this dude is just unloading on us. <laughs> yeah, just, and we, we hit the dirt, like, what the fuck? Is you, you knew it was him? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, because I know where they're at. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm yeah, watching yeah, yeah, them, yeah. you know. Oh, but, shit. you know, you're just trying to get these guys on the same page as you. Yeah. Yeah, but that would happen, like, all the time. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah and, 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 and from your perspective, uh, how did everybody take sort of your decision to work with the Americans? Was there any resistance to that? Were people supportive of it in your life? Uh, <clears throat> actually, my family, especially my dad and my mom, was with me in the first but uh, after just I just was six months in the mission, they just s heard, you know, on TV as well at the same time in the newspaper, everything in the media, the interpreters were killing every day in the mission. Yeah, every single day. A lot of interpreters were like killed. this, you know. So my dad, my mom was so worried and yeah. has concern on this, you know. So when I just, uh, actually the interpreters over there in the post on the mission didn't have access on the phone to talk with their family because we didn't have access on this, you know, there was no antenna, I mean signal to talk with your family. But I have access, but by the helps of my Marines, you know, with the satellite, I just talk with my family via that. And my just, my dad just told me, please, 
please come back hmm. please come back hmm. stop hmm. this like this but i didn't give up you know myself so even my first unit i mean travis and with other people just left over there i was over there i just continue my mission just for more than three more months then i just received my paperwork and came back home for a holiday to process all this paperwork to get to the us like this you know when i just get back to home so my dad my mom just stopped me and just cried please if you're like my our son please don't go back to the mission mm. you will you would be killed interpreters were being sought out it was especially dangerous to be an interpreter you know on patrol interpreters are getting killed because they're out walking around in the same minefields we are they're in the same gunfights we are so they're definitely a part of those casualty counts but also when they would go back to visit their family or go back on vacation you know there there's an an entire al-qaeda and taliban intelligence cells out looking for these people you know i think a common misconception about the taliban and al-qaeda they're just a bunch of dudes living in caves they're not really up to date on technology, man. They they evolve. They've evolved over the past twenty years, and they're, you know, they're, they're they they know what they're doing. They know how to find these people, and you never know who's secure with information because, you know, his information is sitting at, at an embassy or, or, or office somewhere that's supporting government operations. Well, who's to say that a Taliban dude isn't working in there? They can now give up that information for the right price. And now they know, you know, where his home record is and right. family that's real. and stuff like that. That's real. Fuck, yeah. And, and it's and, real to this day. And and did that make you worry that that you were potentially putting your, your mom and dad's life in danger? That that they could Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's why I just didn't go back to mission, but I just I just start searching another job. I just start working on the, after that with the US Army Corps of Engineers, you know, in the Kabul, in the city with a private construction company who was just working on behalf of that uh, US Army Corps of Engineers. We were just building, make the HQ, I mean, headquarters for the Afghan National Police, ANP, and also Afghan National Army like this. So, but I just uh, continue, keep going my working and my task only just alongside with the US, you know? Yeah, yeah, whole, yeah, yeah. Whole my life, yeah. <laughs> I remember we'd get pushed, yeah. we'd get pushed in, interpreters out to us, you know, and we'd run through them, you know, some guys would get out there, man, they just weren't a good fit. You know, what, they, what, they, why? They, they couldn't, you know, show up on time for patrol. They couldn't wear their gear. They, they'd forget their night vision yeah. goggles. And it's like, man, we don't have time to hold anybody's hands. Either you're, you know, about this and you're gonna put in the time to be ready or you're out of here. And sometimes guys would show up and they'd go on that first patrol with us and they'd get into a gunfight and they're like, I'm out of here. Send Never me. again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember Ron telling me when he got the job being an interpreter, you know, he had to take like a, a basic English test. Like, can this guy actually speak English and translate? And um, he was saying that they, you know, they sent him to the airport to fly down to Marja. Well, he had no idea that he was going to be fighting like we're fighting, <laughs> yeah. you know? So he shows up with us and sees like a bunch of dudes with mohawks and cami pain and dirty and you know where there's no showers or toilets or chow halls or we're eating out of bags yeah, yeah. and you know but he you know he stayed you know which says a lot yeah. about him absolutely yeah he yeah. stayed it was really difficult for <coughs> me you know like for a middle city boy just move out for us from his home city you know kid. we we can say for this like milk boy you know <laughs> milk boy <laughs> yeah so just move from his home yeah Live, uh, left behind his family. Yeah, just go to war. You know, yeah. war. Yeah, yeah. We are, we are gear, see the rifle, just uh, see himself in the middle of the gunfight fields. You know, gunfight. It was difficult for me. I bet. But as Travis said, I just stayed. Yeah. 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 He made a name for himself. Did you recognize how special? he was and did that brotherhood begin because you saw how difficult it was for him in the beginning and that he didn't and then yeah. the, was it the choice to stay and come back and not run you know i don't think that you know at that age and with all of that going on your brain doesn't really process what's going on you don't get to pick who you're with you don't get to pick who your machine gunner is the marine corps decides everything That's for right. you everything you know you just you're just so used to saying all right roger we're gonna oh, roll go. with it yeah uh but, you know, once I, you know, started to get the, you know, I, as I said, I got the job with National Geographic and, and really got to step back and see this war from a, you know, a different perspective. You know, you, you really start to reflect on the relationships that you made and like 
uh, yeah, I mean, this guy stuck it out with it. He was one of us. You know, he was in, in all the gunfights we were in. He, he, he was promised by the government to, hey, man, you stick your time out with us. We're going to get you out of this country. This is the deal. And, and once I realized that, you know, that wasn't happening for him, that really weighed on me for a long time. And I realized that was happening in like 2012 time frame. And I remember a, a time with him where I, I felt like I turned my back on him. Uh, when I got that job with National Geographic, I went down my contact list, uh, you know, on Facebook. And, 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 uh, and I remember scrolling across his name. We'd been in communication and I deleted him off Facebook, you know. Because it was like, what if I get rolled up here by the Taliban out here? Because I'm, now I'm a civilian over there. Right. I don't have the protection of a squad of dudes around me. Right. So if I get rolled up on, they take my phone and then they start looking through my content. Okay, who, who's he friends with? I'm friends with this dude. Now they can come after him. But, you know, I, I did it for his own protection. But still, you know, it's something that I never, you know, forgive myself for, huh. you know. Huh. And, and, I, and I always waited over the years, man, and just would stay up at night thinking about it. Since 2010 to 2021, when he, when he finally made it over here, like waiting for an opportunity to make it happen for him. And, and, and were you guys, how, how did you guys communicate during that time? Uh, once I wrapped that job with Nat Geo, I, you know, added him back on Facebook and we talked and strategized and he would send me paperwork and ask questions. And, you know, we would, we're just two idiots trying to figure out how to navigate this immigration system sure. that's a part of America right now. Sure. You know, we, we don't have the word grunts. You know, it's like, I don't know, right. I'm not a lawyer. Right. You know, it's extremely difficult and backed up. And, you know, also I was you know, working with the government, uh, doing private security work with the government. I, I can't be friends with, you know, uh, people that aren't Americans, you know, right. you can, but it, man, it'll, it'll give you some trouble when it comes to get like, you know, time for security clearances and stuff and like that. Um, but yeah, that always weighed heavily on me that, man, there's something that I could be doing more. I'm ignoring mm -hmm. this guy. Like, um, but in my brain, like I swear in my head, like I always knew that we would get something. It, it's going to happen. It's going to get done. You know, we just need that just a little sliver of opportunity and we're going to take it. Did, did you develop a, a hatred for, for Al Qaeda? Did you, did you develop a hatred for the Taliban? hundred percent. How common is that in your country? Do most people feel that way? Most of them. Yes. Majority of people had the same feeling, the hits from them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I can tell for you, like since I born, I was born do, over there and I just grow up and I just like, knew my right my left hands i just had like a diff difficult life over there i was so interested to have like higher education but i couldn't because of economic situation over there at the same time because of this politician system which is running on that country since the beginning until now you know but i was trying myself you know to be an educated person I'm I'm still not an educated person, but I just tried my best, you know. On that time, I my dad was like very. We have like a very poor uh, life, you know. We were rented the house on that time. The computer was like n n there was no computer actually commonly in the homes. I mean, private computers. No people had that one. All of the people just going to this special co uh, courses, private courses, private schools to learn computers like this. So I start, uh, I, I even didn't have money to go to learn computer, you know, in private schools. So uh, my dad just like borrowed money, you know, borrowed money for me to just go and learn this since you like this, you know. When I just came back home, I didn't have any computer at home. So I just draw, you know, I just draw with the charcoal, you mm. know, the keyboard, wow. the keyboard of a computer, just like uh, close by the mirror of the, uh, I mean, to close by window, you know, just I draw, draw up by the charcoal and I just learn the typing from that. I just, I just uh, like uh, imagine that uh, the, the mirror, the window in front of me is like a screen of computer wow. and the keyboard uh, just under my hands which I draw it by the charcoal is the real computer. Wow. He can type better computer. than me now. <laughs> wow. So I learned the computer by this way, wow. you know. Wow. So that's why that's why this made me this made me to make a decision to take out your children to other country. 
or take out yourself to other country to be have not like this. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think when the West came into Afghanistan, and you know, there's a common misconception that it was just Americans there. I mean, all of like NATO is there. You know, they don't, they're, they're not involved fully like we are, but yeah. they're there. You know, so with the West coming, technology's coming and, and it's advancing and, you know, computers, there's starting to be more computers, internet service, cell phones, smartphones. And I think the Afghan people, they start to see what's, what's going on outside these borders and they're seeing the rest of the, the world. And I think for a lot of them, guys like Ron, like, oh, it doesn't have to be like, like we're this. living here. Yeah. We're like the only, you know, there's very few countries living like we are right now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and, you know, and if you look at, you know, what the Taliban, the Taliban doesn't want Internet and they don't want their people to see yeah. the outside world. They, they don't want them to have a taste of it, you know, because then that'll start, you know, causing that little flame in somebody. Do you guys have any insight or opinions on what's driving them? I mean, besides, I mean, I think the misconception for a layman like me is it's just it's all this yeah. sort of like fanatical. Yeah, I know, think kinda... it's just their interpretation of the Quran. Ram, you could probably speak on uh, better on it than me. Just like the, just like the Bible that Christians look at. You know, there's so many different interpretations of, of it. It's just that their interpretation of the Quran happens to be, you know, some pretty uh, wild extremist views. You know, they are against Quran. You know, they are against that because in Quran it's not saying like that's what they are doing right now. You know, they put all the pupils in the cage. You know, they are just want their own power running the country and doing everything for themselves and also they do some activities that not a human being do that you know not i mean not only quran not a human wants to do that they are not a human they don't deserve to say they are a human they are wild animals mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah anybody that'll weaponize a child and load a child up with explosives and tell them to go into this building and blow themselves up. I mean, what kind of psychopath do you have to be, you know? And I think that, you know, it, it, convincing people to, to do that comes from not being educated and being able to manipulate these people in the name of God. Sure. You know, they, they, yeah. they, weapon, they, they weaponize it. They just use it. this. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Like a business for yeah. their, their own targets. Sure. When we ultimately withdrew and how, how, how did you feel about it? How did that sit with you? And, and um, you know, what, just what's your take on that? Um, I mean, it was just, we knew we're not gonna stay there forever. You know, we, we, we can't just take over this country. So we know we're gonna leave. Um, but you know, after you spend 20 years in a country, thousands of our dudes die, men and women are dying. You, you would think that the, I don't know, the uh, result would have been better than what it was. Um, you know, like for instance, when I was in, when we were in Marja and we were in another place called Sangin, you know, where, I mean, just hundreds of Marines and, you know, Army dudes died there. But I remember going back, here I am again, referencing this Nat Geo job, but went back with Nat Geo and I got to see these same battle spaces that we were in, we were patrolling. Well, now I'm back as a civilian and we get to see these places and and they're and it's in Taliban control, you know, like a year later, mm. two years later. What do we why what was all that worth if we're just willing to leave? You know? Because they it goes back to that clear hold build phase. Well we did the clear phase. Where was the hold and build? You know? Where where was that? If that was your great idea, where was that? And why was that worth sacrificing a bunch of nineteen, twenty year old kids? Because that's who's dying. Make no mistake, you know. It is a bunch of kids over there dying. Why wasn't that held? I think that we set up the Afghan army. Um, now, they, they could have done a thousand things better, no doubt. But, you know, we kept the, the, the war going on the American side through massive air bases that are over there. You know, you got Camp Leatherneck, Bastion, uh, Kandahar Airfield, uh, JBAD, uh, you know, up in Kabul. There's bases everywhere that are running aircraft out to places like Mars and saying, and to resupply us, you know, with, you know, beans, bullets, band-aids. Um, when we left, you know, the, the Afghan army didn't have that ability to resupply right. themselves. Right. And the whole time we're over there telling the Afghans, look, this is how you do it. This is how you patrol. This is how you, and it's like, okay, but how do you resupply? And that's something, in my opinion, was never really focused on with the Afghans. You know, they can't resupply themselves. They're out here in these remote patrol bases 
the closest person's 50 miles away. You know, they're getting overrun, and they did all the time. Those patrol bases that we handed over to those Afghans were overrun all the time. You know, they'd either run out of rounds or, you know, take five rounds with them and take their uniforms off and leave, you know. But we set them up uh, for, uh, I'm not going to say we set them up for failure, but they can't resupply themselves. So how are they going to survive? Yeah, once they left or, or, or once you went to the Corps of Engineers, are you worried for your safety every day? Exactly. Yeah. And, and what's that like? I mean, like how, how many people in your life know? I mean, how, how, how common was it that you know, every... ex-interpreters were being hunted down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can tell you there are there are right now, you know, you can search in Google. There are a lot of interpreters killed since American left over there. I mean, not in this last two years, even on that time, you know, in the previous government, you know, they just have access, especially outside when you just walked outside of the Kabul, you know, from the capital, they had the Taliban were present on that time, you know, when they just captured the pupils, they have especially, I mean, the biometric system with their self. They just put your fingers on that and all of your data will just appear for them. Mm -hmm. And they just know, recognize you that this guy worked for the Americans as interpreter. Not only interpreters, also they just killed many, t like I can tell you, thousands of NA, I mean Afghan National Army, the same time. Yeah, we'll just line them up and execute them. Yeah, because uh, interpreters and Afghan National Army had biometric, you know. Can you explain that? What, what, what's the biometric? It's a kind of like a, uh, eyes. Eyes uh, yeah, screening scan your and also the fingers, you know. So when you when they just put your fingers on their machines, small machines, and also your eyes, it's just appeared that this guy is working with the government or alongside with the U.S. Army. So in this reason, I yes, I had concern. Every day I was suffer for this. So if this happened for me, what should my children do? Yeah, there's a vetting process that takes place when guys like Rom come to work with us in Afghan Army. You know, I'm going to make you look at me and I'm going to take a picture of your, this crazy science fiction machine that takes pictures of your retina and your fingerprints. Well, eventually, where's that information going to end up? You know, for instance, like the, when the country collapsed, where did all that go? Yeah. Well, it goes into the hands of the new regime. They have everything from helicopters to guns to night vision to all of our allies' information. Wow. Yeah. And that's how it's being, that's how these guys are being hunted. Did that hit you immediately? Like that, 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 that he was in danger? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew it since we left there in 2010 and uh, or 2011 when we left, you know, like I am, we, we all kind of anticipated that eventually it would end badly, but never to the uh, extent that it did. Never did I think that we would leave guys like Rom over there. You know, I, I would at least think we would like expedite their uh, immigration process to get them out. You know, I mean, shit, they were on the front lines with us, right? you know, so... Never did I ever expect that it would go down like it did. And I don't know how familiar you are. Yeah, with love, the, well, I mean, I'd love for you yeah. to walk me through it. Um, but just the, you know, there was a basically a meeting between the U.S. and I'm paraphrasing here, but there's a meeting that takes place between the U.S. government uh, and the Taliban saying, OK, we're out of here. Yep. We want you to give us a little bit of time, but we're going to get out of here. And the Taliban's very firm on you guys are going to be out by this date. You know, and, and now it's public. Okay, Americans are out. It's hitting the news. Everybody, you know, news channels are pouring into the country to try and because the Taliban's coming, you know. And before they took over Kabul, I mean, you know, the Taliban, you know, Afghanistan looks like this. They're taking over cities and provinces and they're coming in and they're going to close on the capital, Kabul. And then, and, you know, Afghanistan's going to be the Taliban's again. But, you know, from a strategic standpoint, and I'm no general, right? But why would you take away the giant air bases? that were the spine of the war for America, right. you know, Jabad, Kandahar, Leatherneck, Bastion, go down the line of these giant air bases that kept us afloat for 20 years. Uh, why would you take those away in the middle of an evacuation? You know, you know, I think a, a lot of times with the cluster fuck that the evacuation was, you know, you, you hear the politicians say, oh, well, we evacuated 100,000 people. You know, 100,000, that's the largest air evacuation in the history of uh, probably the world. And it's like, well, if you were willing to evacuate 100,000 people like that right. without vetting these people, really, and figuring out who they are, you know, why didn't you do that for the past 20 years? Right, right. 
what, why did you have to bring it down to like it was? Like the, 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 yeah. the, the, the why? Yeah. 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 I mean, the amount of people, specifically kids, that were killed outside that airport in Kabul was, is, is unfathomable, you know. And, and U.S. military, you know, 13 U.S. service members got killed by a suicide attack. In, in my opinion, keep these bases around. And then, okay, you, you're going to evac people. Okay, cool, roger that. You guys, you know, drug your feet on it, but all right. Maybe start flying them to these other bases where we've got a great standoff, where we're not going to get hit with uh, rockets and gunfire. Where you look at the airport in Kabul, the Taliban are literally holding hands with Marines, basically. Not mm -hmm. actually holding hands, but I mean, they're from here to you. Yeah. We've been fighting these guys for 20 years, and I'm watching on TV, there's a 19-year-old kid with an M4 standing right next to a Taliban dude. And you're like, what? is going on here right now yeah. what is happening yeah so it was a cluster fuck and, and what was that time like from your perspective i mean is it you, you just do whatever you can to get out uh actually i wasn't in kabul on that time when the country fell back into the hands of them i mean taliban i was in Istanbul for a business trip wow. at the same time i was trying to gain a visa for my family i mean before collapse the country i was tried four times for my family to get a visa, Turkey visa, to move them to that country to live over there. And where was your family? In Kabul. Kabul. Yeah, yeah, in Kabul. So I was in Istanbul when the country just collapsed and my family just stopped. I was overwhelmed on that time. It was like heartbreaking for me. So uh, Yeah, imagine your family being in a country that was just taken over by the Taliban. You're in another country. It was like killing me, you know. Eight seconds was like passing for me like two, one year. And, and what's communication like? I mean, are you, you, you're talking to them on the phone? Like how, yeah. yeah exactly. But are you yeah, worried WhatsApp, about, yeah. WhatsApp on Through that WhatsApp. time. Okay. Yeah, WhatsApp. And the first days when they just came and had take over the country, the internet was working. But just after five or four days later, they just stopped and just decreased the internet access for the pupils because the pupils just like broadcast in the media what they do with the pupils you know in the first days when they arrived over there they just killed thousands of people thousands you know all the a and &E pupils all the interpreters all the pupils who just uh, like against them in these past 20 years mm -hmm. so i was in istanbul and this ha this incident happened I didn't know what should I do in this time. I have no idea except just I texted to Travis on that time. Yeah. I just texted him like, hey, dear brother, please help me. Yeah, it was a wild time. Hmm. Yeah, so I just told him to please help my family get out of that hell. Yeah. So I, you know, received that message from him on facebook you know messenger i get a message for him because we're friends again on facebook and i'm in san francisco at the time i'm in the bay area for work and i'm sitting around and um you know of course i'm watching all of this on the news and i, I know he's going to reach out to me and and boom the message comes across and, and I, you know, i'm watching the news and you know everybody that i work with is former military guys in the protection field and we're all just sitting around you know drinking beer like man can you believe what's going on here right now and, it, you know, I remember watching the news and watching them at the airport, recognizing places there in Kabul and, and, and seeing the Taliban and kind of doing our own little intel gathering through sources on the Internet, people we have on the ground. And I use Snapchat a lot. I know that sounds like a, something like a 12 year old would use. But, you know, on Snapchat, you can get on these uh, heat maps where you can, people can post live to like where they're at. And it's a great source of information and i remember for 10 years or five ten years i'm on snapchat popping over into Kabul and looking okay i don't see any taliban anywhere they're, they're not and then when that happened i remember popping on the snapchat to kind of get a live view of what's what's outside the airport 
you know, the Taliban's in hiding for 20 years. They don't want to be known right. and seen. Right. But once they took over and they're taking over these provinces and they're, they make their way into Kabul. All of a sudden they're now out Now they're the not open. scared anymore. Right. They don't have to hide anymore. And so I remember hopping on those heat maps and seeing them everywhere. Wow. Out, and it was like, holy fuck. Yeah. And, 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 God, and, and what are the conversations? I mean, like with you and your wife, I mean, what is... What what are you yeah. what are you saying to her and I, and it, it, what what are those conversations like? Yeah, I gonna just explain you. After I just received a positive response from Travis, he was in uh, his job. You know, he he was Travis was not at home. He just told me that right now I just fly, and just like he quit. You know, he just quit his job, not for one day, one week, one month, just for more than one year, just f for my family. So I, I just transferred the same thing what Travis told me for my wife. So for a woman, for Afghan woman, it was difficult to trust, especially on that situation, you know. She just told me, you're you crazy and your brother that you're calling his, uh, him brother, you're crazy. You both are outside this country and you don't know the situation, what's happening. And my kids... My wife was so scary. They were so worried. They were just waiting for killing, you know, Ugh. every second that somebody will can knock the door and kill us. And, and what were they doing? Were they, and, what, and what is her day to day then? I mean, is she is she in hiding? Is she what is yeah. she doing? Yeah. Yeah. I tell you right now. And the first day just came here. They were in my father's home, which was at the east part of Kabul. It's called Karte now. They were just over there in my own home. The home that I built it with my own hands, you know, they were over there. But I just told them, please go away from there. Since I received the message from Travis, I told them my father-in-law home, it was so close with the airport. That's why I just evac I just told them to relocate, move from that location to other location to your father's home. I told her this. So she just started moving from my father's home to her father's home, which was close by the airport. And uh, I was just telling the same thing what Travis told for me. We, I just told him, told her to get ready uh, just uh, for moving to the airport. And the first day just like uh, felt in their first attempt to get to the airport. We tried so much and uh, 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 like you asked it about the how you conversation how was your conversation the internet was not working at all inside uh, i mean around the airport there were around so many the people airports. crammed into there actually not only because of the pu people you know the americans uh you know mo mo uh i just forgot that moa or the that's kind such a kind of uh machines the americans just turn it on the signal the internet was not working around the airport it was a big de uh, problem over there. At the same time, I think the t Taliban also just like uh, limited the internet access for the people. So I just, I was like calling. I just made a connection with my sister-in-law, which was at home. And uh, she was just calling to my wife on direct line and direct phone. Then she was calling, it, she was like passing all the conversation of me to my wife, then from my wife to wow. me. Then I just called, like transferred all the conversation to Travis at the same time. It was like unbelievable, you know, wow. difficult situation. And so they just felt in their first attempt to uh, enter the airport. It was like a huge chaos, you know, around the airport. Like I can tell you more than hundred or two hundred three hundred thousand pupils gathered yeah. in a very small yeah. space in, on concrete too you know you yeah got concrete bottoms and then you got concrete walls they're called t walls you know it's already hot there it's august so you can imagine the heat that's created they're like little human ovens and the idea know? is what like you gather by the airport yeah and you just wait by the airport just... and everybody's got whatever documents they have who however they're associated with americans like get us out and and, and who's deciphering who gets out or not i mean how, how you're just you... waiting on paperwork from the state department you know everybody's yeah. applying for sivs and p2s they're called uh 
online and and you know during this time when he when he contacts me i'm in san francisco yeah i'm fucking pissed off you know it's like i cannot believe that my guy's family is still there after all of this time you know the sacrifice he's made we've been trying i mean you know he he won't say it but you know he he was there with us through everything he when we my unit ripped out and left he stayed with the other marine unit was blown up with them you know was knocked out with them you know this guy has put his time in and here i am sitting in a hotel in san francisco safe my family safe everything's good you know it's just an experience for me you know i went to the war it's just you know this is his life you know but yeah he reached out to me and then you know i kind of talked to a couple close people in my circle and most of them were like dude there's nothing you can do Hmm. like you just got to let this go and from the outside you know now that i've talked to those people now they were like yeah dude you you looked rough because i was up you know like i was awake i'm such a schemer at heart you know like we're gonna make something happen you know, and yeah, he contacted me and then I was like, reached out to buddies on my team and a lot of them were like, dude, there's nothing you can do. Let it go. And then I got one close friend was like, dude, there's something we can do here. And, uh, you know, I called my boss. I said, I'm out of here. You know, this is what's going on. Fire me. I quit. Whatever happens. I don't care. I'm out of here. Flew back home to Tennessee and then pulled out my computer. You know, I had two computers uh, and my, you know, two cell phones running at a time just trying to gather intel of what's going on here, trying to tap into whatever networks. Okay, who do I know that's there right now? Because I've seen it from the military side. I've seen it from the media side. I've seen it from the uh, private security contracting side. You know, I've got contacts there. I just have to go down my Rolodex and find out who's there and see and see who can help us. Yeah. And and that was the whole goal for like uh, for the next basically, you know, two weeks. I was trying to find people there that were able, you know, we'd find people and they're like, dude, there's nothing we can do. It's, it's a mess. I mean, it's a it's fucking a, mess. Yeah, yeah, Everybody yeah. that has a contact over here is, a do, is doing exactly what you're doing right, right now. Right, right. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I'm pulling up maps on computers and, you know, during that time, there's like underground groups being created of just guys like me, former military dudes that have contacts over there that we're trying to get these people out. And so th- these groups are being created and you're slipping into them and these group threads and you're finding information on that, and solid intel, some shitty intel, and you're taking what inf- whatever information's there, uh, you know, finding out where all the Taliban checkpoints are and plotting them on our maps and then developing a plan how we're gonna get his family to the airport. But, you know, the hardest part was finding somebody to be able to snatch them you know, out of a gate where there's a hundred thousand people to get them on a plane and to get them on a plane. Yeah. So I started tapping into my network of, uh, you know, just who do I know out there? And I, and I reached out to a a guy that I had protected, uh, in the middle East and, uh, he's kind of a big wig now. And I, you know, you don't reach out to people you protect and ask for favors. It's just, you're crossing a line, you know, but you know, at that point I was like, I don't care who it is. I'm going to ask. So I hit this, and we're, we're, we were friends on uh, social media, and I hit him up, and boom, he got right back to me. Which is not, you know, you don't see that uh, in, in government-type people. You know, it just, they're not as helpful as you would want them to be. But, man, I, I reached out to this dude. He got back to me and said, one of, my contact is, one of my contacts is in route there right now. This is his name. He'll be on ground in, like, 10 hours, and we're going to try and make something happen. So it was like, that gave us, like, a glimmer uh, of hope. And so I told him what was going on, and then that's when, when we started to develop the plan, and I was showing him maps, you know, here's the overhead of the airport. There's like, I don't know, probably 10 different gates that people are coming through. You know, the Brits are helping out, the Canadians are over there, the U.S., uh, all of our allies are, you know, trying to get their allies sure. out as well. So we started to develop that plan and, and just try and be patient. Uh, and, and all while this is happening, we know an attack's coming. Anybody who's got a brain or any sort of like tactical sense know that there's going to be an attack that happens here. So you're fighting the clock. You know, look how close it packed everybody is. Look how and, close and, they are to the military. And they know they know you've got Americans and other Allied forces there. You've Absolutely. got ex interpreters yeah. and yeah. families of Absolutely. like everyone there is. Got yeah. it. Everybody that's at the airport is trying to leave Afghanistan. So they're all the enemy to the Taliban. And that ticking clock for everybody at the airport is very much real. Very if much. If you don't exactly. make it out, you are going yep, to be. Yep, you're left you know, behind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
So all you know, while that's going on, we're trying to develop plan. And at one point, I'm watching the news. You know, I'm watching the news. Some uh, reporters doing a piece to the camera there, and I look in the back. I'm like, that's my. I know this dude back there, and wow. he he's on a gig over there with this person. Wow. And I reach out to him, and uh, he's like doing a or the lady that he's with is doing a live piece to the camera. And I'm like, holy shit, that's the dude. That's him. You know, I'm not gonna say his name, but he. So I like pull up my phone and I send him a message. Like I'm watching you right now. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like a glimmer of hope, you know, like somebody's there that I know what's this look like out here right now. You know, what's going on? Do you see a good Avenue? What's, what, what's the best gate we could send this family to? And, um, but yeah, it was like a glimmer of hope. And I reach out and text this guy and then there's like a delay, you know, there's like a 10, 15 second delay because they're on the other side of the world. And I sure enough, I see him like take his phone out. Yeah. And he, he's texting me back, and I'm in my hotel room, probably butt naked, Holy you know, like shit. jumping on my bed, like, yeah, dude, here yeah, we go, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. And then once once that happened, I that's when I told my boss and, you know, my team, I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going back to Tennessee. We're going to make something happen. You know, and I hopped on a flight, went back to Tennessee and set up the little, I call it the redneck Jason Bourne operation, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. And like, we're going to make something happen right here. And so I got the computers and everything set up. And, you know, by the time I got home, that that contact had landed on ground from the guy that I protected. His friend it was on ground. And I already had messages like in the chamber for him to receive as soon as he lands. Hey, I'm a friend of so-and-so. He's pointed me in your direction. What can you do? You know, and he responded back with, you know, I just got here. Give me a couple hours. We'll assess the situation and what's going on. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there. So, you know, be on standby, be, be ready to move. And at this point, I mean, like when you're breaking this story down to somebody new, it's like at this point, I mean, you're, you're communicating mostly through, through message, right? Yeah. It's not voice. Yeah. Through, everything's text. You, you're, yeah. you're, you're, I mean, you're, you're making these appeals. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know exactly what to write. What are you writing? I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to leave any fat on what I'm writing. Right. Right. These right. people that are there don't have time. Don't to have like, time for that. No, here's what's going on. But they on. need to know this is tremendously important. They yeah. need to know the sacrifice. Yeah. This that is, he's this made is the guy. Country. Here's my connection with him. Here's his family. This is what they look They're like. They're there right now. Can yeah, you help? Great. If you can't help, yeah. I don't care if you're the president of the United States. Yeah. I don't want to fucking talk. I don't, yeah, yeah. I next. don't have time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. we are on, you know, the, the clock urgency is ticking is right now. Just... It's unreal. And and when you when when you're getting this information and then you're communicating back because you have no line to right. his family. And I don't speak the language. Right. Is there a risk every time you're communicating with your family? Is there is there a risk? I mean, just just that communication that could be intercepted. That's putting them at, at, in danger. Absolutely. It was high risk. Every second, I was scared or worried maybe they will just like track my wife's Right. Phone. So do you have to decipher sort of this is a message I want to pass on or this is a message I'll wait until I get a little bit more to give something? Like I was, I was like telling to my wife to please delete every message you're receiving from me. Just delete it. D- delete it. Yeah. Yeah. Soon, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Your got it. Phone. Yeah. Got it. As soon as you All get it. Got messages. it. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Got and it. she also needed, you know, a lot of people are showing up with paperwork to plead their case, you know, like, hey, this is the paperwork that I have. Please let us through. Right. Well, they're crossing through. There's 30 Taliban checkpoints outside the airport right now. So if that, you know, you're going, oh, come here, who are you? Let me search you real quick. Now I got this document. Yeah, let's go over here in this back alley over here real quick. You know, and, that, and that's what was going on. So we're, did she end up uh, bringing paperwork with her that exactly, she had? Yeah, yeah. she did. She, she, I just told her to please keep this like hiding the paperwork that uh, Travis t- sent me and also I sent her in the email. Then he, she just like put it all the paperwork inside her breasts and because if the Taliban search them, they will like didn't touch on the women's. Huh. We know this because they, they didn't do this That's but for the males. They just search it all around of the body. So that's why she just put that all the paperwork here and she, because of the checkpoints. And so she's putting that all, all, all within her bra or whatever, but what are you telling her to say when she goes through Taliban? Che- I mean, because if they're there, they're trying to get out. Like what, what is she, did she go through Taliban checkpoints? Exactly, yeah. and they did, and, not and, one, many. And many. and many, and so what is she saying to the Taliban? Yeah, well, actually, oh, I'm y- sorry. I'll, let me just back up a little bit here. You know, we knew that it's his wife and her three small kids. And we're watching on TV and gathering information. The airport's a wreck. People are being trampled. Babies are dying. Kids are dying and just being thrown on sea wire. 
you know, the Constantina barbed wire, bait, dead, dead kids everywhere. It, it is a chaos and it's a fight to get out of this country. And so I knew that his wife and those kids aren't going to make it through, you know. So we start kind of exploring, okay, who can help them? Like she had, she had two brothers, two younger brothers that I, you know, I like enlisted to help. You know, he had mentioned uh, them before and I was like, okay, this could work. And so I was giving them like, I need to see how like reliable these people, people are. Because if I tell you to, to walk and I tell you to take 15, sex, or 15 uh, steps and then stop right there and then turn in that alley, I need you to do exactly that. Because I got a contact walking around out here that's trying to snatch you. You need to do exactly what I'm telling you to do. Mm. Um, so I, was, I started giving them like little side quests, you know, like, hey, go get a stroller. Um, no, I, I told you, I said, go get, uh, go get Wheel, a, go get a wheelchair. wheelchair, yeah. Go get a wheelchair, you know, and I want to put your wife in a wheelchair so she can hold the kids and an umbrella so she can stay in the shade and, you know, and maybe they'll take pity on her. You know, you're, you're just coming up with whatever you can come up with. So they run down to the bazaar and they come back with a stroller. Yeah. You know, and so instead of a wheelchair, it was a stroller. And at that point, I remember we shared like a little bit of humor, you know, like, hey, you learned a new word today. Yeah. You know, that, that's <laughs> called a stroller, you know, and I'd send them to go out and get uh, like battery packs for cell phones, you know, because who knows? Uh, I want you're going to stay there until that last plane leaves. We're going to give it 100 percent everything that we got. So they come back and they proved, you know, OK, they're listening to me. We can make something happen. And I told them to tie like a red scarf around them so they can be identified mm. and i told them to go out and take a picture of everybody so i can send it to my contact you know so we my contact knows what these people look like but then once they had all the equipment and, and you know gear to make this push to the airport and water uh, i re my you know i reached out to my contact said they're ready it's like all right send them and so we sent them to a gate called east gate first and they go to the gate and i mean it is a fucking madhouse you know just like you can envision just thousands upon thousands of people you know just nut to butt this close with kids you know just chaos Every, all the kids are you know sick and tired and heat stroking sure. sitting out there all sure. day and and so his family sat out there and i had a i actually had a contact you know the airports like this and east gates like right here he left through a gate over here and you know traversed through taliban checkpoints just a single guy came out dressed like you know afghan went out and uh you know at that time his family was relaying where exactly where they're at and i was having them take videos and pictures so then i can relay to my contact okay this is what you need to look for they're around this area and i remember they were underneath a little green uh like canopy like this you know umbrella here and my contact made it all the way up there to him and i identified him wow. and saw him wow. but there was nothing he could do you know if he would have he couldn't get through that gate. He couldn't make it through a hundred, you know, or through tens of thousands of people that were at East Gate at that time. So we had to wave it off, you know, and that was such a like, dude, we were so close, you know, and his family ended up waiting and waiting and waiting out there. And his kids, you know, had heat stroke and they ended up leaving. You know, they couldn't, the kids needed to get out of the sun. And so his family ended up uh, leaving and, and, and going back home and uh, just rehydrating. And it's like, we're going to do it again. And at that point, his wife was just, terrified you know Ugh. like and again he, she she's talking to two guys that are running this operation that aren't even in the country, in the country right? and she's and, and, like who the fuck are these guys right 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 right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah i want to like be 100 person to be there you know because my wife was alone my yeah. kids was alone nobody was with them but it makes it impossible it makes it yeah, more dangerous exactly yeah. yeah but at the same time it was more dangerous if i would I couldn't go there, you know. Yeah. The borders were closed. Yeah. There was no way. No the, flights. No flights. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like very difficult for Ugh. me. Each seconds, it was like putting me on the grave, you know, second by seconds. And we, not only me, me and Travis, you know, we didn't like sleep for more than one week, day and night. We just work on this to out of the, to out them safely from that situation. Wow. So what happens what happens next? Um so we're going to go round 2 at the airport now. Eastgate was an epic failure and like a punch to the gut. You know, I had confidence going into when the family went to Eastgate. It was like I got a guy there, like we're going to make this happen. I know Marines are there. 
you know, which is like, those are my boys, you know, those are my people. Are and you in contact with them? I'm trying real, real yeah. hard. I'm up on Instagram. I'm looking at, you know, they're all freeze a frame that I saw on the internet or on the news and of a name tape with a unit. Okay, that's this unit that's there. Wow, and then you're just tracking And down. then I'm getting online, you know, uh, at, at night in Kabul, you know, because they're at different times, you know. So while Afghan, you know, while Kabul's sleeping and the airport's shut down, I'm back home here trying to collect intel, okay, make a plan on what's going on. And then when, when Kabul wakes up, Everybody's back to trying to go to the airport. Well, I can't sleep because I'm in contact with my uh, with my contact who's wow. trying to, you know, you got to be like on your toes because once this dude says go, you got to go. Yeah. So it's you don't keeping miss them. that because you're at fucking Hardee's exactly. or, or taking a nap. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, during that whole time, we're, I'm making contingency plan after contingency plan. I'm, I'm, I'm zooming the map out, looking at the overhead. Okay. I'm, I'm reaching out to redneck buddies back in Tennessee that are good at driving dirt bikes. It's like, hey, I know you're a crazy fuck. Would you be willing to fly into, say, India with me? We cross into Pakistan and then we go in the border, right. acquire a car. We're going to get this dude's family out. Right, right. And right. of course, that dude's like, whatever, man. Let's go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whose yeah. car are we taking? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So we're making all plans, you know, just every plan that you could make. Yeah. Um, and just scared out of your mind the whole time. You know, I never had, I've never had that kind of pressure on me before. Sure. This isn't just some random dude who reached out to me. This is my interpreter's family you know and i'd never met his kids but once he starts sending me pictures of his kids man it's like dude you fall in love with them immediately yeah, yeah, yeah immediately yeah, you're yeah. like i know these kids i've never met them yeah. but his little son yeah. looks just like him yeah we're yeah. gonna get these dudes out yeah 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 uh, and now you're on mission i mean this is this but is, dude the amount of pressure that was yeah, on you know yeah. i'm sitting at home in tennessee in front of some computers and I got a little golf cart I drive around. I live on the river. I got four acres. And I'm riding around in my golf cart with my headphones in, waiting for calls from contacts, wow. texting him, strategizing in my brain. And my neighbors, are, you know, they're all like, what the hell is this dude doing out here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time. But, you know, from I think from an outsider's perspective, it looked like I was having a PTSD yeah. meltdown. Yeah. And I don't blame him for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's no time to walk. There's no else time to it. even have yeah. that conversation. Right, right, right. There's no time. Right. The clock is literally ticking right, right. now. Right. Um, so the you know as the um, the days progress, it's like okay, we're gonna make another run on this gate. And my contact reached out to me, and and you know he's like, I think Abbey Gate is gonna be the, our best bet. Let's try and get him through Abbey Gate. And I agreed with him. You know, I'd seen the overhead maps and, and other video that I've obtained from that gate. It's the best place to get grabbed from the crowd. You know, the Marines have a, an extension out there. There's like a big road that comes across and all the Afghans are lined up on this road. And then here's your entrance into the airport. That's where everybody's trying to get to. So there's just thousands of people packed in here. And then there's the sewage canal. And then there's all the Marines that are lined up and other government entities that are there maintaining security, make sure nobody jumps over the walls and the right people are coming through. Uh, so my contact reached out to me and says, Abby Gates it. We're going to do it at this time. Get your family ready. So reached out to him like, hey, make sure your kids are hydrating, eating food. Convince your wife to to go, you know, because at this point she's like, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Mm. You know, and I'm like, listen, lady, I've never met you, but just trust in, you know, our process right now. I know your husband. We know what we're doing here. We're pretty crafty. And she was like, no. <laughs> Yeah, because she was she afraid she was like yeah. afraid. She afraid, scared. yeah. Especially because of my children, you know. Each each seconds, every minutes was like a possible. There was possibility or chance of their death. I mean, in the middle of that crowd, that right. chaos. Right. Mm -hmm. Because of that, she was so afraid and said, "No, I I don't want to go back right. to that airport." Right. To that situation. Right. And they're sending pictures of these just horrid conditions. You know, there's a there's a picture that really struck home with me with his oldest daughter uh, that was sent to, yeah. you know, Rom from his wife. It sent this picture and sent it to me. And it's a picture of his oldest daughter uh, just laying, you know, sitting up and kind of leaning on a suitcase, sitting on top of human feces. Oh, my God. You know, and it was like no child deserves to go through through this, let alone my boys. Yeah. Like kid yeah you know and it was just like man and there was a lot of times where there was no hope in that you know it's like 
we're going to try everything we can, but I don't think this is going to work. Mm. You know, there's a lot of doubt that you're sure. battling and, and facing. Sure. But anyway, the my contact reaches out to me and says, hey, we're going to make another run at this. Get your family ready. Give me an updated picture of them. So, I, you know, they whatever clothes they changed into, I had them go out and take another picture of them, tie the red bandanas on, get the kids in the stroller, bring water, bring your battery chargers. Uh, I don't know if they had an umbrella. I think I told them to grab an umbrella yeah, they for did. shade. They still have those umbrellas. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need that umbrella. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so they, they went to the, to the gate, and it, and it was a madhouse. Because, again, the clock's ticking. You know, all the whole world knows that that last flight out of there, I, I wish I had the date in front of me. I should know it. It was like August 27th, something like that was the red line, you know, that the Taliban drew. The Taliban said, we've negotiated. And how with far you away? How far away are you from that date at this point? It was the 20, 20, 24th. 24th. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. It's just 24th. a matter of days. Yeah. Yeah. Two days. We're close. And we've been at it for two weeks. You know, dude. I've been telling this dude to be patient for two weeks. Trust me. Trust in this process convince your wife to go that's your only job um but so my again my contact reaches out to me and says get the family ready and i'm you know just through the roof like here we go um and so instead of texting him you know because we're usually i called him directly and i was like hey my contact's there this is what's going on and he's like <laughs> there's like humor in this he's like brother this is taliban trick no we can't do this you know it's like <laughs> Everybody's being told there's a contact there and to go to the airport right now. It's this is a Taliban trick. We're not right. doing this. And I was right. like, if you've ever listened to me <laughs> in your life, yeah, like yeah, yeah. you're gonna do exactly yeah. what I'm telling you to yeah. do right now. Yeah. You yeah. remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I convinced him and thank God he convinced his wife and they loaded up and uh went to the airport and you know, the whole time this is going on, I'm in direct contact with my guy at the airport who's outside of a gate and he's got his guys, his operators that he's pushing outside the wire to look for these guys and I'm relaying positions where they're at at all times. Um, and one thing we're battling that whole time is cell phone service, you know, cause we finally made it all the way up there to this gate and now they don't have cell phone service. And now I can't relay exactly where they're at. Yeah. And it's like horrifying, you know, so, cause they've yeah. came so close and now we, we, you know, they're not going to be able to find them. And, and we, we went through shitty uh, cell phone service, that whole day and finally they they get to the airport my contact sends his guys out and they end up spotting uh one of the brothers and uh flags him down and it was just like a and my my contact sends me hey we've got eyes on him and it was just like unbelievable that it's just i mean it's finding a needle in the haystack with all these people because you know you got to understand with the amount of people that's in here I mean, just picture going to a Metallica concert with all these lunatics right, and trying to make right. your way up to the front row. Right, it's not right, going to happen. Right, right, right. There's mosh Everyone's pits. trying to get to Everybody, the front row. Everybody, no one cares, dude. And it's Everybody's... not just to see fucking Lars fucking play the drums. Yeah. It's like yeah. life is life yes. is that gate. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and people are willing to do anything because they're, they're in the same situation because they've got kids too. Right, right. And you, you, it ain't happening from the middle. Like, you no. know, like it's only happening at the front. Yeah. And so we, we got them positioned. Wow. I'm telling them to get up in here and, you know, get in, get in the crowd. And I think at one point she was attacked. Yeah. She yeah. backed off and it's like, no, I'm not. She got cold feet. No, I'm not going to sit here and watch my kids get trampled to death. It's not happening. Uh. And, and I remember being so selfishly fucking mad at her, you know, looking back at it. It's yeah. like, you know, while it was happening, I was like, well, she just needs to listen to me. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and even back when I told them to leave the house, okay, okay leave the house right now. You, my contact wants you there. You're going to leave the house right now. And I remember them taking a long time to leave. And I remember messaging him like, Rom, I told you yeah. to have your family, you know, ready to go at a moment's notice and leave. And it took like 10, 15 minutes. And, you know, looking back at it, dude, she's saying goodbye to her entire family <laughs> that she'll never probably ever see again. Nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, a whole life. And here I am, some American sitting in a golf cart in Tennessee, mm. telling her to hurry, mm. you know, for a good reason. Yes, for sure. but, you know, I look back at that and it's like, man, it kind of like shows you like the different perspectives. Totally. You know, we think the answer is, oh, just do it fast or right. do this. And it's like, dude, especially she's from a goodbye. grunt's perspective, right? Yeah. Like you're used to being the yeah. grunt on the ground. Now right. you're the general calling the shots. Yeah. 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 But anyway, so they fast forward back to Abby, you know, they, they make it to Abbey Gate. 
and they, they start to position through the crowd and, you know, they start to encounter, you know, some rough stuff getting, you know, she's getting beat up, pushed around. So she pulls out and, you know, Rom's like, no, she's done. Right. You yeah, remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I she was just... so scared on that time when she just attacked by the crowd pupils on that. And she just laid down on the ground. And, uh, I was like thinking that she will be die like this. How, you know? how, 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 how old are the kids at this point? Uh, my twins was like, uh, two and a half. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, and my older daughter was six. So, so she she's holding the the. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's holding the two kid, the, the yeah, twins. The twins. Yeah. And then the six year old is what just holding on to her. Sure. Because so, I think yeah. she pushed him. She pushed him in the stroller, or they got him in the stroller as far as they could. Right, and then, but then it's they got to ditch crowded. the stroller. Yeah, yeah. 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 stroller's got to go. Whatever yeah, extra that, stuff's going to go. People, rest of people didn't let you go. Of course. Or for Of course. And the brothers are just doing what they can. Yeah, because everybody wants to leave. Of course. Course. there was no priority right 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 right. i mean this, no you order know? yeah yeah and so they you know they you know rom convinces her hey you got to try it again and i remember messaging him like this is your shot at freedom right now this is the chance for your children to live a life that you know that you could have never imagined uh and rom convinced her and he's agreed okay we're gonna try it again and sure enough they go back in there to try again and that's when the one of the operators comes out, sees them, and then calls them over, and they kind of got to go through the crowd, and the crowd kind of parts the ways a little bit because they see a guy, you know, motion them for him to come here, and they uh, they cross that. You remember because all the Afghans are here. There's a giant sewage canal in the middle, and then that's where all the Marines are on the other side, and so they swim across the sewage canal with the the kids above their heads, and uh, hand them up to those dudes. <sighs> And they, you know, snatch those kids up and then that my contact reaches out to me. Hey, we got them. Ugh. Dude, when I heard that, you know, when I think back on this whole story, I, I don't have memories. I mean, I've got a, I knew I was riding around in my golf cart, pacing around like a lunatic in my yard. But when I think back to that two weeks we were doing this, like I struggle with figuring out where I was when I found out that information. Because yeah. when I flash back to that time, like I'm there with them. My memories are in at Abbey Gate with them. My memories are at their house or in a taxi outside the airport, you know, because I'm familiar with all of those areas. But, man, when the, they swam across with the kids above their heads and handed them up to those dudes and, you know, they snatched those kids up and my contact, you know, was like, we got them. You know, dude, I just fucking collapsed on the ground. I mean, it was unreal. And then, you know, obviously relayed that to him, you know. What did you think about it when you... Yeah, it was, it was, I can say, like the best moment of my life when I just received a message from Travis that he told me, my contacts got your family. No worry at all. They just made to enter to the airport right now. It was the best moment, I can say. Yeah. And I was so lucky and just my tears came. I couldn't like stop. Yeah. You know, regardless of paperwork, you know, because the immigration is just a nightmare to get, but, and they're still not U.S. citizens, but when they cross that sewage canal and those Americans touch them, yeah. they are, a fu they're fucking Americans right then. Yeah. And it's the coolest thing that the Marines have ability to do. You know, we can touch somebody and you're now one of us forever. <laughs> And your kids are going to live a great life now. Yeah. You know, I get goosebumps talking about it. I mean, it was just the craziest roller coaster of emotions. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what would have happened if, if we were unsu unsuccessful yeah. with that. Because they, they took those kids and then they, you know, made them walk. And then they threw them in a up armored land cruiser and drove them out to the flight line. And they went into a building and... Okay, verified who they were, and then I confirmed with my contact, hey, what flight are you putting these, these guys on? Because at that point, it's not they're not just sending 100,000 people to the U.S. Right. There's countries opening up their borders all over, like not great countries. Right. You know, we're right. talking third world countries over in Africa right. that are like, uh, you're going to give us how much money to take these people? Right. Okay, yeah, bring right. them and let them sit in the desert and we'll give them some water. Right. And that was also a big fear. You know, we don't want to have them end up in a country like that. Right. 
right. where we kind of, you know, we lose contact with them because right. there's no cell phone service. Like, right. this is, you're, you're realizing this is an, a massive hurdle you just got over. Yeah. But you're not there yet. We're not there yet. No. And uh, my contact is the greatest contact you could ever have. I wish I could reveal who this dude is. Uh, but he doesn't want to be named, you know. I understand that. I I don't. I'm not. I'm not yeah, interested yeah, yeah. in that. I, I. But that being said, I guess the one thing that I'm in it, was your contact there because I, hearing this story and trying to put myself in both of your shoes, I would imagine like the heart, the hardest thing is to keep motivating this contact like at any point right because you feel like you're going to burn them out right and like at some yeah. and like what is the contact doing there like what is like is the contact doing specifically yeah this? He's, he's there on behalf of the of the government assigned a certain task from dc to go in there and do a certain thing uh, 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 understood but like I, I correct me if i'm wrong i, I imagine the contacts job that day or job being there is not getting certain people out is that what he's specifically supposed to be doing there no i don't I, I think he was there to assist in that process but you know you know i made it clear to relay to these my contact and both my contacts that set this up like this is a dude that isn't just some random afghan dude this right. is a dude who's on the front lines with us has carried my dead dudes around to helicopters who's carried gear for us and he's done everything we could ask and I was be sure to, you know, I was sending them pictures too. Like, here's a picture with me and this dude back in Marsha in 2010. Like, this is who this dude is. Right. And also letting those dudes know and kind of putting the heat on them. Hey, if you don't make this happen, my ass is going in there. Mm -hmm. And I know you don't want that. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't look good on you guys. Right. But I, I wanted to, I didn't, you know, I wasn't talking to him roughly like that, but I wanted him them to know but, that, but, but but it is it's such a it's such yeah. a crazy thing to navigate yeah. because it's like your wife everybody has got to you know, you know sort of achieve this this impossible goal, but at any point you know if she if she said look I just can't do it or like hey look man my hands are fit. like we tried like yeah. there's so many chances of failure absolutely it just, absolutely and you're just the whole time you're just you're yeah. just praying to to for it to work. Can you talk about? getting eyes on them for the first time? Well, or? I had him send, uh, I was like, send me a picture of them. Like, I want to see a picture of these, you know, in the airport. And, uh, you know, my contact sends me the picture. And then again, just boo-hooed, crying, you know, thought I was tough, you know, because I'd been to Marsha back in 2010, hadn't yeah. shed many tears. And here yeah. I am just, yeah. you know, in my sunroom at my house, just crying and sent, relaying him these pictures and also relaying it to other friends. Uh, that knew what was going on, other Marines that we were with, other Army guys that he knows, and they're all crying too. And, you know, it's just unbelievable. And and I also had him confirm, hey, where's the plane going that you're sending them? Because now I'm right back on to, okay, I got, another, I got another thing here. You know, this is, we don't want this to roller coaster or start spiraling into another problem that we've got to solve. Sure. I want them on a flight to the USA. Sure. And... You know, once he got them in that building and verified who they were and sent me that picture, and then I said, okay, where's the flight going? And he's like, USA. It was just like, let's go, baby. And uh, and they, they went, you know, they walked them out to the flight line, and there's a bunch of Afghans piling on. I mean, they're cramming these uh, these planes for these transport planes. Uh, and, that, you know, they, they, they take off. And he sent me a, a pictures of them walking out there and getting on the, getting on the wow. bird and taking off and leaving. And uh, they ended up going to, uh, where'd they go, Qatar? Yeah. Yeah, they went to Doha, uh, Qatar, uh, where there was like a little staging area for refugees coming in and uh, like processing uh, facilities. And, you know, not, I want to say it was like six or seven hours after that happened, we got them out and that family was snatched out by those guys and brought in and, and gone. Their lives are changed forever. A suicide vest came in and blew up and killed 13 or killed 12 Marines, one army soldier. Um, and the death toll of the Afghans that was at that gate, it's over a hundred oh and climbing right there. And, you know, we'll never know exactly sure. We'll never know exactly for hundred percent sure if those were the guys that snatched our family out. But I would say there's a good, Certainly good possible. chance that it was those dudes. God bless him. Yeah. Unreal. 
you know, how close the, his family was to being right there. Because it was right there within feet of where they were at. You know, and to see that hit the news, and it was just, at that point, you know, you're waking up after finally, okay, the family slate, your uh, family safe, they're on a flight, let me try, I have to sleep, my body's going to shut down, and then waking up and seeing that on the news. You remember that, Rom? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah. When did you get to hold him for the first time, touch him for the first time, and cut her? Oh, no. It was, it was a difficult time, you know, when you are being like separated from your kids and your families i was just like waiting for the paperwork process even it was not on that time started my paperwork when my family just got to the cattle you know because me and travis was didn't think for myself on that time just for my family you know sure. so i was waiting just for like one year or more like this you know held up in turkey waiting on paperwork yeah. wow to get or, to america yeah exactly e even even with your service yep. exactly. exactly yeah exactly yeah totally i can say it, it was like a more than one decade you know like 12 years waiting for this yeah. you know but especially in this period i just left my kids like i said for you they were two and a half years old so i saw and hugged them when they were four years old wow for three, two and a half years, I was away from them. Yeah, separated from them. Yeah. You, uh, you know, he he left Kabul because the USA wasn't taken. You know, it's like, you can't come here. So Rom's like, Roger that. Let's keep the ball rolling. I'm going to get my family out somehow. So Turkey accepted him. And he did everything he was supposed to do over there, get the visas. And he you obtained the visas, right? Yeah. He obtained the visas and sent them back to Kabul, to the Turkish embassy. Yeah. And that's when... Kabul was taken over and all of those embassies evacuated. Wow. Yeah. So if they would have had the Turkish passports, they could have left. They could, wow. Yeah. But wow. it was yeah. that passports close. Was, and their passports was inside the embassy, Turkish embassy on that time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So it was more difficult for me on that time. And I would, like you ask it when you just hugged them, just like after two and a half years. And that was, and that was, that, that was stateside. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What was that like? Uh, it was like December 2022. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. When I think I it was the 24th, right? Or 23rd. 23rd. Day before Christmas Eve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 23rd, December yeah. 22, I just got here finally. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a good moment as well, you know, when I just <laughs> hear from USCIS, you know. It was, it was, this paperwork was like for me going from hell to paradise sure. i was waiting like this you know because i was messing for my kids yeah. you know yeah. yeah every time when i just called to my daughter to my oldest one she was saying why you're not coming where are you everyone has that but not me so it happened for me and it was like a you know like there is a power above us, above me, above my family, just watching us, you know, mm -hmm. it was happened the same gate that when I just start working with the Marines, my family just left at the same gate to the US. The same, the same gate where I just start working with the Marines back yeah. in 2010. I just flew from the same gate to the Marja. Yeah. When he got you that know, interpreter job. When he, when, back in 2010, when he became the, you know, okay, you're an interpreter, you're going to go to Marja, go to the airport and go to the, go to Abbey Gate. Because so that's where you're going to find your yeah. helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. They just evacuated from the same gate. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's. But, you know, that's a, that was a whole nother battle getting him here because he's stuck in Turkey. And unfortunately, he's not the priority. It's, it's getting women and children and all these people out. And he sat in, in refugee camps for, how long was it total? It was like a year and a half? Yeah, it was a year. Yeah, yeah. total. Yeah. yeah. So he went from, you know, Doha, he went from Turkey, linked him up with some contacts there, yeah. sent him to the refugee camp in Doha. It was taken forever there. You know, all the background investigations that take place and, and, and for good reason. For sure. And, and Rom agrees, too. I mean, it was a pain yeah. in the ass and we were disappointed that it wasn't expedited. But we both agree for good reason. For sure. It's a price of freedom. Yes. For sure. Uh, and they sent them to Kosovo where there was another uh, base there. What was that camp called? Uh, it was 
Leah. Leah. Camp Leah. It was named after, if I'm not mistaken, it was named after a baby that was born, an Afghan baby that was born exactly. on an evacuated, yeah. uh, on a flight that, that left Kabul. Wow. So they named this camp Camp Leah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. I'm, wow. I hope I'm getting that right. I'm pretty sure that's. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, while, while this is going on and you're going to Kosovo, where, where, where's your family? Well, they, they got my sent family, to. Go ahead. Yeah. Just my family got here just like one year like before I just start, uh, my paperwork started, right. I just start moving from Turkey to Qatar, then to Kosovo. Right. They just got here. And they're in, where, where are they? They're, they landed they, in a place called Fort Pickett in Virginia, which okay. is like an, uh, an army holding uh, base um, for ref processing refugees, because it was such a fast thing. Nobody was processed leaving there. So yeah. now we've got a little time. We're going to actually process who these people are and really dig into who they are. Um, so they sat there for what two months? Right? For, no, for more than three months. Three months. Yeah, yeah. they were over there for yeah. further processing yeah. of the paperwork, of the like medical examina examination, everything's like yeah. this. And and your 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 wife emotionally like, where, where, how, is she happy to be there? Is she sad to like? Where, 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 where? Yeah, in the first in the first when they just evacuated on the aircraft in military, it was the first time for a woman with the thousands of people like maybe more than like thousand you know in a one aircraft yeah they just gathered to each other you know there was no other privacy to some men just touch you around your back or around your hands or on your legs lamps like this so for her it was so difficult i bet very difficult and also you know she didn't wash her body her feet for more than two days from from going through all the sewage the sheds, canal all wow. the sheds all the dirt from the sewage canal yeah when she just crossed that it was just inside at her body wow yeah and she just like had very like a bad smell and so when they just got cattle and after that they just got to here in four packet when I was talking with her, she had a good feeling, yeah, good. and she was so happy, and she didn't care about anything on the past. She was just thinking for the future, especially for my kids, yeah, for our yeah, kids, yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful. And when that was, you know, was going on, it was like these people, Rama. I don't care what you say. Your family's coming to live at my house. Yeah, yeah, you know, they yeah. Got nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be damned if we're going to make it this far. Right. And you get thrown uh, in a dangerous neighborhood right. somewhere. Because that's, right. what, that's what happens. Uh, yeah, is a lot of refugees end up going to the inner cities of these places. Number one, where it's dangerous. Number two, where it's they can't afford this. They've left everything behind. They don't right. have credit. They don't. Right. And you're going to send them to go live in this other war zone. Right. right. So I was like, absolutely not. So I, I rally my little uh, town together. And, you know, we collect donations. I mean, at the drop of a hat, I got a, my wife's friends, you know, they, at the drop of a hat, man, they had beds, clothes, wow. go down the list and anything these people would need. I mean, it was like overnight, it was appeared in, in our house. Yeah, it, it was awesome. So and you so, had the family there with you before yeah, he got yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what, what was that like? Unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> you know, it took forever. Once they got to Fort Pickett, uh, the the army base for processing. It was it was it two months they were there. Three months. About. Three months. Yeah. yeah. So they just and you can imagine after everything I've been through, I still haven't met these people. We're preparing for them to to get here. I, I don't have a job. Right. This is my job now until right. Rom gets right. here. Right. 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 And yeah. is your girlfriend now your wife? Yeah. Yeah. And and is she excited about it? Yeah. 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 This must have been. Crazy. It was interesting to see because you know I know Afghans and I've traveled the world. You know she at that point she hadn't really. You know, so she's asking, like, oh, you know, do they speak English? Like, yeah. do I have to wear a hijab? Like, yeah, yeah, I'm like, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it was interesting to see that the, that clash of uh, I bet. cultures. I bet. I yeah, because it was like her. She's a uh, labor and delivery nurse, so she okay. she meets you know people who speak different languages. Sure. But, you know, to have somebody like that live in your house. Oh yeah. And, yeah, it was interesting. Interesting to to see. But yeah, we finally got the call from Fort Pickett. Hey. Uh, these people say that they're going to come live with you. Are you on board with that? I'm like, let's go. Uh, put them on a plane. And they flew them uh, into Knoxville. And um, my wife, me and my wife were hanging out, waiting on them. And then I've got a tracking device on the on the plane. You know, I know exactly where they're at. And they land like here they come. And then, here, you know, here they come through, through security. And, you know, it's like they went from people just 
that I just saw pictures of to like, I'm now holding my interpreter's kids. Wow. You know, it's just it's the most, it's so powerful. You know, it is so powerful. You know, that's the realities of war. You know, that's, yeah, sure, you know, military people, they get out and they have issues and this and that, but, you know, dude, this is, those are the ones are the most affected. You know, these kids, mm -hmm. you know, these kids would have never gone to school, especially mm -hmm. the two girls, they would have never gone to school. You know, they would have just lived under darkness, like, like Rom says. Yeah. Um, but to have them show up, and man, we, it was like I knew them, you know? And I felt that, you know, from them too, you know, it was like, oh, this is that crazy fuck. Yeah, because you know, <laughs> yeah, remember, you know, in the beginning of the story, his wife's like, I, I don't know your crazy friend. Like, yeah, who is yeah, this yeah, dude? Yeah, yeah. He's in Tennessee. But yeah, yeah, when they showed up, it was just, we swooped them up and then, uh, you know, we had been collecting donations and I put the word out in my little, you know, southern town, which I also want to point out, and a lot of people have asked me this, you know, the South has such a uh, stigma for being racist. And, yeah, yeah. You know, we don't like people that aren't white rednecks. Right, and right. And that is such bullshit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I feel it necessary to, like, clear that air for other people to hear. And a lot of times it's people from the, that aren't even from the South that are making this assumptions, you know. But we're all poor down South together, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And my little town came together and blew it out of the water. Yeah. You know, these yeah. kids showed up, but they didn't have social security numbers yet. They didn't have, you know, they were missing so many documents and things that were required for them to attend schools. Um, but, you know, before those kids showed up, I went to the local school system where me and my wife went to school. You know, just a tiny little town. Kids that we went to school with are now teachers and administrators. And so it was cool to walk in there and like... Hey guys, we don't have kids because I don't. We don't have kids. Uh, I don't know what this is about being a you know like a parent here. I don't know what to do, but <laughs> I know I got three kids inbound here. Yeah, and I don't know when exactly they're going to be here, but the dad over here wants them going to school like right away. That's right. You know, immediately. That's right. Which is real cool on him. Yep. And so we lined it up with those administrators, and um, I remember when we got word finally uh from fort pickett that you know they're coming to tennessee everything's ready the green light let's go you know the day before they came i went into that school and i went into this like uh administrator's office building and it's all just a bunch of, you know it's all a bunch of women and i, I walk in there and I, dude i didn't have the words to even tell them that hey, okay the family's here like mm -hmm. i walked in there and couldn't even speak you know just cried my eyes out mm. and they knew what was going on you know and while i'm sitting there just crying like a bitch they're like lining up paperwork in front of me you know these little so oh, just sign over here baby <laughs> yeah you come on now just hey it's It'll gonna be okay out. just sign here hey they gonna be here it's all right you know and i'm just crying my eyes out and you know hugged everybody and thanked them and man our town rallied around these people and i'm so proud of those people Beautiful. i'm so unbelievably proud because they moved faster than people you know i'm talking to people in the white house when sure. this is going on i've got contacts everywhere not that i'm just like some high speed dude but you know when you when you do this work you meet a lot of people and those women in that, that school district in my town moved 10 times faster yeah. than any government entity could have even thought to do because it was and, the and right I'm, thing to and do. i'm so proud of them yeah. for that that's beautiful yeah, so they showed up. We picked them up at the airport and brought them back to the house. And, and man, I got two little two and a half year old twins. I got a six year old girl. <laughs> Nobody speaks English. His wife speaks a little bit of English. Uh, the two brothers spoke a little bit of English. And it was just, you know, because we're used to living that quiet life. You know, we don't have kids. We're hanging out here on the river. My biggest concern is like, when am I going to mow? Like, yeah. when is it? When is it yeah. going to rain? Because yeah. I got to get out there and mow and weed. Yeah. And it went from like we got a house full of afghans here yeah you know yeah it wild dude but so cool to you know they're riding around on my lawnmower you yeah. know with me yeah. like they're yeah. loving it they're like yeah oh, let's go so awesome yeah. but it was it was so interesting to see like the language you know they didn't speak in any english and now they're full-blown wow can speak all the english they how can. long they've been here just two years yeah two, two years. years yeah two years yeah, yeah. same wow. month august 
but that time was really hard because he's still stuck sure. in Turkey. Sure. You know, and my bank account's dwindling. It's like, yeah. I'm not a rich guy. Yeah. Like, yeah. and I also told him like, hey, I'm, I'm not leaving until your family is in a stable environment. Man. And, uh, but yeah, the donations just poured in. You know, somebody donated. There was a, a great couple out of Knoxville that donated. Uh, they they didn't been involved with refugees in the past, and, and this this great woman um, uh, donated. She knew she wasn't going to be around that much longer, and she donated a, a suburban, older suburban, wow. but it was in great shape. And wow. I mean, it, it was just true Southern hospitality coming wow. together to bring these people in and to make it happen. I love this story so much and I'm, I'm, I'm so like blown away by it. And, you know, it's all the, you know, story of, 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 of brotherhood and, and, and family and, 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 and America and fatherhood, you know, and dedication. It's not normal, man. Like, I, I don't no. think most people would do, you know, would, 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 you know, come, I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, did you know something about him? that he's the guy that would do that? Like, why, he, like, how did you know that he was that guy? Yeah. Cause this is above and beyond anything I've ever heard. Right. I mean, it's yeah. like, how, what about him? What, 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 what made you reach out to him? Yeah. I mean, I just trusted on him than myself. You know, we, we just had a time when we were in the mission, you know, we were ready to sacrifice for each other, you know, when you're ready to sacrifice your blood for other person, so you don't need to trust to him anymore, you know? It's it, the trust is nothing, you know, I mean. It's it's just gone, you know, everything. Just you you do what he says, you know. What what he says, you you just like believe what he says or or in his word, you know. And you saw that in combat. Exactly. You saw you you exactly. saw exactly yeah, who I you were. I, I I had like fully trusted on him you know just he just said me one word nothing else that i help you so i just left my family with for him you know my family's life everything if i didn't receive any message from travis in any reason you know maybe he was busy or didn't access on the message i didn't do this i didn't accept this risk it was a big risk that i just accepted this and I just left it everything's for him and I thought that he is doing everything that I am doing for my family and he did he was like a father for my children until I got there and he did more than than me everything's for them you guys came together yeah. you know under uh, uh, under these sort of like insane circumstances where trust was so almost impossible yeah. to build and in, in, in as chaotic and uh dangerous and, and just as rough an environment as as possible yet this bond was built and it's like you said it's um clear hold and build mm -hmm. you know like you saw this mission yeah. through yeah and and together you know working on this like he didn't you know the, i'm just like like what hearing the story there's a yeah. million chances for this thing to fall and there's a yeah. million chances for you to say hey yeah. look dude i love you I, I, you call me if you need anything yeah. but like you, you quit you quit your job like you quit you 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 just you literally put everything and and then yeah. it, it just it, it it kept going you know it's like it's it's it, i mean it's it's almost like what you said about the south i i i you know it's like sometimes there's like these misconceptions you you know i i think there's maybe misconceptions about our our military about the the the, the strength and the the the, the inner the, the inner honor of, of of the marine corps like I, I don't know what it is but this just does not seem that most people would go to the lengths that you that that, that you've yeah, gone uh, to you know i had the ability to do this you know not everybody and this is the most non egotistical answer to your question but I had the ability to do this not everybody lived the life that I did not everybody ran off and joined the Marine Corps and met an interpreter and then quit doing that and then found different jobs overseas to explore the Middle East and, and you know Afghanistan and, and and make contacts you know not everybody could have made this happen mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, me mm -hmm. you know and I knew that mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I knew it, it was my ball to fumble mm -hmm. if it didn't happen mm -hmm. Does that make sense at all? It, it does. I mean, I got it. I mean, it's not, it is a non egotistical answer. I, you know, 
to me, it sounds like a Herculean task and it sounds like a yeah. task that like, just like you said, five minutes, you yeah. know, whatever it was a couple hours later yeah. at that same gate, look at, look at what happened. Yeah. So it, it like your ball to fumble. I, I like, think, I think maybe, you know, th- what I've learned since I was 18 years old, you know, from Marine Corps gunfights, IEDs to sticky situations, you know, here in the States or in another country, you know, there's nobody really coming for you except the dudes that you're with. Yeah, there's government entity, entities out there and three-letter agencies that'll come pitch in depending on what the situation is. But, you know, you, you got who's around you right now. And, and I'm not going to be the dude that just says no to this guy. Because knowing Rom, he's going to find a way to come here. You know, he will find a way. This dude stops at nothing. And then I'm supposed to go visit him and be like, oh, yeah, sorry, I couldn't help you out. Work was more important. Right, right. You right. know? And that comes from the Marine Corps, I think, you know, from being a, you know, in the grunts, right, in the infantry, we don't have uh, the assets and and people behind us that, you know, special operations communities do. You know, they've got C-130 Spectre gunships and Apaches and jets and, you know, sharks with laser beams on their foreheads, (laughs) right? They've got every capability out yeah, there. Yeah. If we're lucky, we get some air support. Right. If we're lucky, that that bird coming to pick up our wounded is there in under an hour. Right. You, you know? got the guys next to you. That's it. That's it. You know, and that, and I really like that though about the Marine Corps. You know, especially the grunt unit stuff in the Marine Corps. Everything is so simplified. Like, do the task at hand. If there's a building in your way, blow it up and get through it. You know, there's no. We're gonna do this. It's something that I've always taken. You know from the Marine Corps. It's just simplifying the task at hand and getting it done. And, 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 you know, this dude was, he's a friend of mine. You know, when I call somebody a friend of mine, you know, I, I take that, you know, it's a big deal to me. You know, I've got buddies back home that I'm very, very close with who have kids. Um, you know, if, if something ever happened to those dudes, you know, bet your ass I'd do the same thing, you know, and I think a lot of people would, for sure, you know, but it's just they don't have the opportunity to do that. Um, but, man, I just love this dude. I don't know what it is, Rome. He's a good-looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm enormously grateful to you both and, and bless both you and your family, man. It's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful story. You got um, – is there anything else you guys want to – we're definitely going to, as part of this, um, we're, we're going to add the GoFundMe stuff yeah. and we're going to figure out ways to raise money. If there's anything you guys yeah. want to say specifically about that, you could you could, you could, could say it now. Um, we could also do it if you guys have something we can just, yeah. you, you know, you know, tag that along. But if there's anything else you guys feel like yeah. you want to cover in this or anything else you want to say. You know, I, I'd like to say, and I appreciate being given the opportunity to say it, you know, the, I, I think it looks like, Oh, the hard part's over. He's here now. His family's here. They're safe. But as we know, look at our economy right now. Here's a guy coming over. You know, being in the military, I've got VA benefits. I've got health benefits. You know, there's disability benefits out there. There's resources. You know, for these guys coming over, there's nothing. And they left everything behind. Banks are frozen over there. All their assets left behind. And you better so, believe he was part of he, yeah. he, was, he was a part of this yeah. war and he he, yeah. he fought alongside exactly absolutely so you know his struggle still continues um you know they're still being relocated you know they still don't have a home yet we got him an apartment some people came together in our town um you know the rental market's a disaster right now just housing in general's ridiculous right now but you know i'm not going to stop until i see this guy with a key to his house and walking in his front door and then i think that's when i can take a break you know but i really want to see this guy in the house and that's what we're we're raising money for you know he deserves it his family deserves it they deserve some sort of normalcy and a place to call home in an in an end to this relocating you know because they're being relocated around nothing they they need something permanent you know i'm tired of having question or seeing question marks in his eyes like well what's going to happen next this, that, you know, they need a home. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm fighting for to get them. And we'll find a way. Yes, you will. Period. Yep. Wow. Some, something will come along where it, it happens. I'm, I'm positive. 
you have any, any anything else you want to say before we yeah like travis said we are like right now just struggling with this situation uh but let me just say that i am really grateful to him to his awesome wife you know her name is kelly yeah and this is the best wife <laughs> best partner for him and for me like a sister and uh, i also just want to appreciate all the community you know the pupils who just helped my family through this time you know they yeah. were with my family like their family they didn't just give it like bad feel for my family that they are from they just came from other country you know my wife my kids just feeling they're involved with this community right Beautiful. now people yeah. people found a way to get involved yeah they didn't have money to donate to our you know we were on the news and people were coming together and donating and dropping off items and i you know the, our little town we live we got a little grocery store nearby and you know this little old appalachian woman recognizes me in the store this is one of my favorite stories but she's like i mean if you want to talk to her i'd need to translate for you you know <laughs> she's just got a you know banjos in her mouth <laughs> Yeah. But she uh, she walked up to me. She's like, little tiny little lady, hunchback. She's like, now, I sent you on the news. Yeah. And I ain't got no money. But I want you to, and she had two rotisserie chickens. So yeah. She's like, I want you to take these chickens over to that mama. Okay? Tell her we love her. Oh, and, I, you know, I went to thank her. Yep, that's it. You know, and she just mm -hmm. walked out. Yeah. You know, but, but so her. many of those encounters like that, they're finding a way to help. That's what really, like, blew this out of the water. Yeah so beautiful yeah the the people of our town man they're just incredible people i wish i could hug and kiss all of them mm -hmm. but it'd be weird yeah. you know <laughs> did, did 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 uh is america what you expected exactly yeah yes not my wife but me yeah yeah why, why not your wife yeah my wife because you know she didn't just went away from the my country you know she didn't have any travel outside the country and she didn't like uh, have uh, experience of this kind of other pupils you know even she just came arrive here she didn't expect this that what travis kelly other americans especially our town people you know do for her you know yeah, yeah. but just after two three months she's like fall in love yeah, with all good. of them you know Beautiful. yeah and she's a real american right now <laughs> yeah, i can yeah, say yeah, this yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the change in his kids that's happened over the the last two years is really cool because you know they showed up not speaking any english and now they're starting yeah. to da -da -ding, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> which is really cool you know and they get it from my wife man she she's comes from long appalachian yeah. heritage you know and she's like oh my gosh what's it what's going on what's this you know talking like this and blah 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 and, yeah. and so now these little especially his two little daughters man they really pick pick up on that she's way. there there couldn't have been a better female by my side for this i mean she's just a Bless beautiful her. woman beautiful soul happy always smile on her face mm -hmm. and uh always doing makeup and hair and southern bell mm -hmm. you know and, and i think those girls really you know they were there that was their first taste of an american woman is okay who's this woman here and she she was just awesome but yeah we're starting to see those little southern accents come through <laughs> that's so awesome. like she we went to the beach and then uh we went to the beach one time and then uh we came back and the oldest was like kaylee did you bring me any seashells like all right forrest gump what are you talking about <laughs> yeah oh yeah. it's so but great. it's such it's such a cool story it is you know man. and it, it's not just what happened. The incredible thing isn't what just what happened in Kabul and getting them out. I mean, I, to me, what what happened when they came to our town is even cool. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's so cool yeah, yeah. To, to load up these kids and then go into this store. And I got three Afghan kids and, you know, it was just it, it is so cool yeah. to experience that and, and to load up his kids and specifically his daughters in the suburban that somebody donated. Yeah. And pick yeah. them up and take them to school where me and my wife went. Wow. And to watch them. You know, I, at first I'm terrified to let them leave my side, but I'd walk them up the steps and take them into the classrooms. And then finally the, the, the oldest is like, Travis, no, you stay in the car. I'm, I can walk up here. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it, man, it, it, you want to talk about powerful watching the, that little fearless girl. Mm. Uh, she was in kindergarten at the time, run up those steps. Yeah. Is just the coolest. I've done yeah. a lot of cool things, but bringing this family 
to, to my town is the coolest thing you could ever do. Yeah. It's beautiful guys. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that you, you shared with us and, um, just bless, bless both of you and your families, man. It's really, really cool. Thank you guys. Yeah. Appreciate Thank you having you. us on. Thank you. Oh, come on, come on. Uh, I can say that, uh, I have n not as pressure as I had, like in the previews in the past, I just feel myself, my family, like a uh, very peaceful, very like in a, uh, rest, uh life here uh the only thing that i have pressure right now is only i want just one day like in this kind of meet uh, uh like a podcast or just like this kind of meeting my daughter you know my daughter my kids will be sitting here and talk what they did you know mm -hmm. for this country mm -hmm. yeah this is only my pressure that I hope I can just like handle this, you know, and I try my best for this, that my children will be proud for this society. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. And this is one of the main target for myself, for my wife. We don't want anything else. They should just grow up here and they just serve for this, for their country. I remember when he landed here, sorry to keep rambling here, but when he landed, uh, you know, I let him stay at home for a couple days and I was like, I gotta go see this dude. You know, like I've been waiting for this dude to come here since 2000, you know, 11. And I went and hung out with him and I was like, you need to go to the store. Like you need socks, shaving cream. Like, what do you need? And, and so we went to Walmart, of course, you know, love Walmart. Uh, <laughs> but he, uh, he bought two American flags Wow. You know, and hung him from his uh, porch on his yeah. apartment. That's something that will always stick with me. Wow. Yeah. I love you know, that. Uh, you know, this guy has every reason to be upset about how long it took him to get here. and But he's he's got every reason for, for the spot that, that he was put in and his kids were put in for a lack of due diligence on our government's, uh, you know, behalf, specifically immigration people. Um, but he doesn't matter to him. Went and bought American flags, hung him from, you know, his porch. His kids are spitting, you know, American history to me when I come in, Yeah. you know, they're like, Travis, you know how many stars are on the uh, American flag? I'm like 50. They're like, no, 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 no. The old American flag with 13 stars, you know, the colonies, you know, I was like, yeah, Rom's putting in work with them. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. Why not? Well, thank you guys. This is, this has really been special. I really appreciate it. You're most yeah. welcome. Appreciate you having us on and, on, you man. know, being a voice for military dudes. So we, we appreciate yeah. you a lot. You're Thanks, well known in the community. So Thanks, bro. it's a real honor. For real, me. keep doing what you're doing. I'll do my best. Yeah. Appreciate you guys. Thank All right. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, man. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate Thank you. you man. Thank you. Thank you. I hope all that made sense. Man, it was great. You guys were, I mean, it was great. Are you kidding me? Whew.